on the Planning and Environment Committee, which is an application for material change of use of food and drink outlet shops and offices, 214 David Low Way, Perugian Beach. It was referred for further consideration, and we have Nadine Burwood and Patrick Murphy from the Planning Department here. Um, Patrick, for those who are listening to you, just give us a brief overview, please, and any changes to the recommendation since the last portfolio meeting. Can I deal with that for you, Frank? Councillor Wilkie. Um, so this was an application for um, um, so a redevelopment of an existing or, building down at um, Bridge Beach. Uh, it faces on to the uh, service lane of David Low Way and also on to the village square. The application was... Do you want me to run through the whole application or just the change? The application... Um, in a nutshell, what, what the application oh, okay, is yes. seeking to do, yeah. achieve, it was, in terms uh, of number oh, of okay, tenancies. Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. Okay, so it was uh, proposed to renovate the okay, downstairs so level. It was uh, changed to the, the existing tenancy downstairs, downstairs to allow for um, shops and build a new second car parking requirements, landscaping requirements and setback requirements. An infrastructure agreement has been prepared and agreed to with the applicant. Um, uh, proposing a contribution in lieu of the provision of car parking spaces. And as a result of discussions at the um, uh, Planning and Environment meeting, uh, where it was raised the, about the non-compliance with landscaping, staff went back to the applicant and asked them if they were prepared to address the non-provision of uh, open space on the site with the provision of additional green walls. The applicant has come back with um, revised plans that can be presented and the revised plans indicate the provision of planter boxes to the <coughs> terrace slash deck. Oh, yep, sorry, go back one. On the upper level, uh, planter boxes across the um, eastern section of the uh, upper level terrace, along with, um, on that side around the internal stair, two green walls along the, uh, along the sides of the internal stairs there. Um, planter boxes to allow vine over the pergola, that's on the upper level, and then on the lower level, so the one plan above, not the next one down, sorry, that one, and some green walls on the ground floor adjacent to the stairs. Nadine, just to clarify, um, <coughs> the landscaping wasn't it possible wasn't, it wasn't because possible. of the zero setback. So that's this, correct. this is um, done by the goodwill of the that's applicant. correct, yeah. yes. So the existing building uh, on the ground takes up the entire floor space, the entire, entire site. So this building uh, is provi providing a new internal uh, lobby and lift area and stairwell. And as part of that, they're opening up the building and providing um, some landscaping with a planter for a significant tree on the ground floor. And then they have indicated that they would provide these green walls. So the recommendation, uh, there is a draft recommendation that's been indicated which updates the uh, recommendation to include these amended plans. It also includes an additional condition 37 which requires the submission of an operational works application <coughs> for landscaping which would ensure that we get the planter boxes and the green walls. And uh, also at the suggestion of um, uh, Councillor <coughs> Lawrenson, uh, an additional advice note has been included about the provision of solar uh, panels for the development. Okay. Questions for staff, councillors? Or would someone like to move the recommendation? Move, Councillor Lawrence. Second. Seconded, Councillor Stewart. Councillor Lawrence. Uh, just oh, can I just see that, um, that note uh, point? I haven't seen that one before. <coughs> I'm happy to read it out, Jo, if that right. helps. Yeah, thanks. Thank um, that council encourages the implementation of sustainable and efficient energy infrastructure to minimise energy consumption and the production of greenhouse gases. In this regard, council recommends the installation of solar panels for the development. <coughs> uh, council's, uh, council's clear on the other change in red above. Might be worth uh, reading out for those people that are online that haven't uh, actually seen it. I'll read that out. A separate development permit for operational works landscaping must be submitted to and approved by council prior to issue of an application for building approval. The landscape plan is to detail the provision of 
permanent planters along the upper floor plan terrace area, permanent planters along the central lobby, internal green walls around internal stairwell, planted to support <coughs> vine over pergola, feature tree and understory planting of ground level. All landscaping on site is to be maintained for the life of the development. Councillor Lawrence, you have the floor. I oh, just want to thank um, Nadine and also the applicant um, for just understanding what our community requires in terms of um, just sustainable and green um, energy efficiencies. Um, the inclusion of the advisory note, I think it's really important and um, would be great if it's even a standard with all the applications. Um, Nadine, we can't mandate or impose a condition to install solar panels. Um, but we can make a, a bit of a noise about it. And I think a statement with every application um, just states a really clear position, a council position. Um, also, I want to thank the Perigian, um, Perigian Beach Energy Hub. Uh, the president there sent an email to all the councillors and um, <coughs> just highlighted the project aims of the Perigian Beach Energy Hub, which is to encourage greater rooftop solar uptake um, on the retail and commercial premises at Perigian Beach. Um, so I thank him for bringing that information to Council. Um, and again, thank the applicant and the Dean for all the work um, in communicating what we need as a Council. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, the Councillors wish to speak to the motion. I suppose just to reflect uh, what Councillor Lawrence said, uh, that it, it is good to see a developer responding and, and improving designs in accordance with what we aim to to um, achieve in Noosa, which is a subtropical design and uh, wherever possible using uh, vegetation to soften um, built elements. Um, I think it's really important to understand why we can't um, condition solar panels. And when we drafted the Noosa Plan in 2020, we did actually have uh, requirements for solar panels uh, on all new, new, all new buildings. And the state have a position that that is in conflict with the Planning Act because uh, it's a building matter. Um, you may recall that we put a motion up to the LGA conference last year um, challenging the state on that policy because I think it's a very short-sighted interpretation of the Act. And it's one, I think, you know, at this stage where we're limited to just providing advisory notes, and I think it is, as I think the Council Lawrence and intimated, it might be something we put on every development that has a roof, um, but it should be something that where local communities uh, uh, shouldn't be bound by just the minimum of standards <coughs> under the Australian Building Code. Uh, they should be able to set uh, higher standards to respond to the emergency that we're currently facing in terms of climate change. I'll just add to that, um, although as stated, the, the applicant was not bound to provide landscaping because it's not possible on, on the, um, the, uh, in, in the zero setbacks on the site. They were willing and open to consider that and include that in their, their application. The idea came was floated, I think, by Councillor Stockwell in the committee meeting last week. And um, <coughs> the staff talked to the applicant. They were open to that. Yes, they uh, were. The advisory note about solar panels on the roof um, are they open to that as well? They are. They. I have spoken <coughs> to the um, consultant this morning, and he indicated that the developer is keen to provide a, a sustainable building, mm -hmm. but they hadn't really looked that far in terms of the provision of solar panels. So, as an advisory note, he said he yeah. Yeah, certainly happy to consider yeah. that. So, in in closing, uh, I agree. Uh, we can perhaps take that approach to all developments in, in future, things that we cannot <laughs> mandate, but we can suggest because this, um, the response of this applicant shows that there are applicants out there who are willing to help and do the right thing and engage and help create more sustainable buildings, and that's a fantastic thing. Jo. Last question to start first. Is there scope in the planning scheme for green walls? Is it with, is there within the scheme itself at the moment? Yeah. No. Is that something we should or could perhaps look at as a means of providing landscaping where landscaping may otherwise not be 
uh, available, such as this this development, and actually have that as a as an option to have I green walls. As yeah. I mean, <coughs> vertical, vertical green walls are, would provide a landscaping uh, solution, as yeah. as we yeah. implemented I think in. You've got a good point there, Joe. There's probably a number of sites, you know, commercial sites where we find it a bit challenging in terms of getting some green interface with the, with the public realm uh, because of the built form that's existing on the site. So the, the scheme were to incorporate some sort of vertical landscaping or on upper levels potentially as well. Yeah. Um, it would certainly be of assistance. So perhaps we take that to take that away as a note to talk to the street to plans about the options <coughs> around walls and uh, yep. future planning scheme members. I'll talk to the uh, um, thing. Uh, look, I, I don't mind this uh, uh, development, but yes, some of the challenges that were there and I see these uh, this is a very workable, practical solution to provide landscaping where landscaping otherwise may have been overlooked or, or not considered. Uh, certainly green walls are uh, uh, an innovative way and a, a very 21st century way that a number of developments are, are now integrating uh, green spaces into their, uh, into their developments where perhaps they may not have in the past. Uh, also, the, uh, the element of uh, energy efficiency and, uh, and solar panels, I don't see why any developer would not be considering solar panels with the increasing cost of electricity charges that have been um, bandied around, uh, ongoing uh, challenges for, uh, for all with regard to uh, the current financial situation that many find themselves in. And uh, the payback, if anybody does a business case, the payback for solar panels is, uh, is uh, uh, well and truly uh, viable and worthwhile. So I would encourage us to... Uh, continue to recommend the installation of solar panels for every development. I would think any developer with the worthy site would actually do the business case and realise that it's in their interest to turn around and implement uh, um, all of these sort of energy efficient uh, practices wherever possible. So I support the, uh, the recommendation and the uh, changes that have been implemented. Any other speakers? Yeah. Karen. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I support this. Um, especially thank the staff and Councillor Lawrenson for bringing it forward in the advisory note um, and the applicant who was willing to have the conversations. I think it's great, you know, we talk about challenges, but this um, gives us opportunity um, to collect data, have those conversations about a future we'd like to see. And although at times it's aspirational, we can innovate and drive this forward just through these narratives and conversation. So I think it's great. And along the way, then we can collect that data we can you know, collect how many people that want to develop here are happy to you know, have the conversations and learn as they go and along with us. So I think it's a great example of community coming together, especially with the, um, you know, the Green um, community members coming forward and reaching out to council and putting forward that suggestion. So I think it's a great we're moving forward together with a collaborative approach to um, you know, reach our climate targets and um, work towards the, the goal that we are different by nature. So thank you, I support it. Councillor Lawrence or Councillor Tom? Councillor Lawrence, you wish to close? No, thank you. Put the motion those in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Next is um, Planning and Environment Court Appeal on DB 928 2022 application for a minor change to a development approval for a service station and shop and operational mm -hmm. works signage at 54 Mary Street, Mooseville. Mm -hmm. It's been referred for further consideration. Mm -hmm. Councillor Stockwell. I'd like to move a procedural motion that the matter be held over to the last item on the agenda and be dealt with in closed committee. Okay. Um, can I just ask a question? Um, we'll get the motion up first. I'm oh, happy to second it. Can yeah. argue it for Um, I've got a question too. Yeah. Is that the, the matter? Yeah. Sorry, no, the matter be the held matter. over. <coughs> be held over to the last item of the agenda. Confidential? I just last item of the agenda. Stop where you have the floor and then we can have questions. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I do so because um, 
while the matter has been reported in open session, this is, matter is before the courts. Um, any discussions uh, that we have that either agree with or disagree with the staff advice um, have the potential to be prejudicial to council's interests within that case. Um, it may be that in the end of the day we do elect uh, to follow the staff recommendation, but if we yeah. don't, uh, I think it would be inappropriate for those discussions to occur in, in a way that provided the um, applicant with uh, our thinking on the matter. Councillor Finsley, we had a question. Uh, yeah, just with regards to that, um, given you know our commitment to transparency back to the mm -hmm. community, um, and given that the information is provided in the report, I'm just I just seeking further clar mm -hmm. clarification as to yeah. why the need by Councillor Stockwell um, is put forward today to go into closed session. Pretty obvious as to why. question to me. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, really clearly, um, historically, um, the process in these situations was always these matters were dealt with closed sessions, um, probably about four years ago, um, in the name of transparency. Um, a decision of the previous CEO was to put them into the public domain. As I said, my concern has always been, and in this case still is, uh, that we are prejudicing our own case by dealing with a sub matter in open, um, in open council. Uh, we are uh, uh, defending a decision to refuse. Um, the reasons uh, given to settle um, are things that are debatable. I've got a good question. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, um, and it's a question for our CEO. Um, just, we've got very strict requirements under what we can and can't do go into confidential session under the Local Government mm -hmm. Act. Similarly, I mean, I've seen many, many tens, tens if not twenty of these that planning to defend an appeal over the last three or four years. I understand what you're saying, Councillor Stockworth, was historically four years ago, but I mean, we, we've dealt with at least, uh, I mean, 30, 40, if that, of exactly the same, and we haven't gone into confidential session. Mm -hmm. My question is, why here, why now? Mm -hmm. And if we are going to make a change and, and it's a policy, policy decision, uh, should that be done separate to this table? Uh, because in all fairness to previous applications, we've, we've done exactly, we, we haven't gone into co closed for any of those. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if the community, what, what specific requirements justified under the Local Government Act for this one? Um, through the Chair, Mayor, um, I, I don't want to be drawn debating in, into yeah. this at all, but what I'll, I'll put forward for is on a factual basis. Council Stockwell can move a procedural motion um, to place any item into closed. Um, that aligns to the reasons that we have available under the Local Government Act. This does align it because it is in relation to legal matters. Um, so it does have the ability to be discussed by Council within closed session. Uh, council then has that ability to be able to deliberate. Um, yes, seemingly there has been a long-term view and um, there may be other divergent views at the table around that, particularly around openness and transparency. As council officers, we would like to understand the views of the table in the future mm -hmm. um, so that we can respond um, to what the council would like to see. Ultimately, the decision by officers is following how council has made decisions mm -hmm. in the past. Um, that is why this is an open session. Um, I don't disagree with, and it's somewhat a personal view now without any debate, I don't disagree with what Councillor Stockwell has said in relation mm -hmm. to this matter. Um, however, it is um, a longer term um, position that Council has had. Mm. As a result of that, officers have followed. Um, there are no issues with the procedural motion. It absolutely um, aligns to the reasons why Council would consider a matter enclosed. All voting would be in open. Um, and um, if the um, resolution of the council in coming from closed is contrary to that of the council officer's recommendation, there does need to be a reason mm -hmm. that would be put forward from there. So that's the advice that I can provide, um, uh, and not a policy position as such. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as we know, these um, reports that you have before you um, are, are approved by myself and signed mm -hmm. by, by myself. It is, Council officers presenting their best work to the council. Once it gets to this council table, this council has the power to make the decisions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Any other okay. councillors to speak to the motion? Well, can I just make a comment? I, you can speak to the motion. Yeah, well, I, I think the debate is over when and how and what the process 
is around if we want to change that or moving into the future. To me, that's the debate. I don't think that that's reasonable that this case now becomes like part of that debate. I think it's two separate issues. And um, yeah, I don't really support going into that closed session for the debate over this item in conjunction with then a broader issue, bigger issue around council process in relation to um, how we proceed forward as a council dealing with these matters. Thank you, Councillor Finzer. Are there councillors wish to speak to the motion? I want to speak in favour of the motion because this is a contentious issue and clearly some councillors disagree with the staff recommendation. Any discussion specifically about a staff recommendation in a legal matter which is before the courts by nature really should be confidential. There is another discussion to be had about how matters like this, whether they go straight to confidential sessions or not, that is a separate discussion. But the reasons I'm supporting this going to confidential is because there is a dissension and contention around this decision to settle this. And we need to thrash that out. And thrashing it out in the public when the matter's before the courts is extremely unwise. Amelia. Um, I'll speak also to support um, the procedural motion to bring the discussion in closed sessions for the same reasons as Council Wilkie has just outlined. Um, again, I think best interests of councils, council is better served behind closed sessions in a legal matter. That's, at, that's presently um, un, unresolved. Yeah, I'll speak in favour of the procedural motion as well for all the, the reasons outlined. Um, I dare say the reason this hasn't uh, cropped up before is because there hasn't been dissent with the, uh, with, uh, the, um, uh, the staff recommendation. In this case, there uh, appears to be some, uh, some elements of, uh, of challenge of it, so uh, I'm prepared for that to be uh, discussed. And uh, as Councillor Stockwell alluded to, those are probably best discussed when legal pre proceedings are before us out the uh, um, uh, playing our hand to uh, uh, to the applicant in this case. Councillor Tom. Yeah, of course I'll support the motion, and I think that we're even st somewhat slightly overstepping the bounds of what we should be talking about. Even saying that there's some mm -hmm. dissent amongst us, I mean that even that should be in confidential, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, do you have uh, a question? Question, Councillor Finzel. Given it is a legal matter, is that because it is before the courts, does it have to go into closed session? Who's the question for? Oh. Councillor. Are you happy to take that question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it would be prudent for Council to uh, discuss any matters that are before the courts within closed session. Um, and I understand the motivations in the past of having complete openness and transparency in relation to Council decision making. Um, however, there are some matters from time to time that Council should discuss within closed session. It doesn't take away the fact that decisions are being voted upon and ultimately made in the open, but that discussion should happen at that time. So um, this is entirely appropriate to be heard within um, closed provisions under the Local Government Act. And just to clarify, Mr CEO, the discussions will be behind closed doors, but the decision will be an open Council. Chair, absolutely, yes. The requirements for Queensland local government is that all voting is held in the open. Um, there's no debate or discussion that's to occur coming out of closed, um, but um, the decision is immediately made open and the voting must occur in open. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other councillors yeah. wish to speak? I do. Councillor Stewart. Um, look, I'm really challenged on this one. Um, because there has been <coughs> a precedent, of certainly well, this term of council, that we have always discussed these matters in open. And as I said, I've gone, there's so many that are planning to defend the appeal, and we, we've discussed them on camera. Um, I appreciate that if there is some, going to be some argument uh, or some in, uh, debate um, around the table that we do need to go into closed. I appreciate that. Um, but I, and I will, I will support this, but I think going forward, this is something that we really need to sit down as a council 
uh, and talk about at a process level and certainly at a level in regard to um, what we want to do going forward because if another one comes up then we have to really follow and be consistent so I think this is, a, this is certainly one for a discussion outside this room and this table about what we see um, as important to us as a council uh, and, and our debates when we go into closed and when we don't, uh, bearing in mind the legal constraints, but also weighted with the transparency and openness that we pride ourselves on. Um, so, question, oh, Councillor Lawrence. Um, question to the CEO. In terms of all confidential um, sessions that we have in council, uh, at what point is that information in terms, in regards with legal cases, when is that information available to the public and how can the public access that information? Um, through the Chair, Councillor Lawrence, um, the decision is made in open. Uh, the legal process would follow any standard legal process. Um, it is very much dependent on the type of matter that's before the court or the decisions being made, but as we know, all justice is in open. Um, yep. So if there was a member of the community that was particularly interested in the matter, they would have the ability to be able to follow this through a planning and environment court process and understand the decision that has been handed down um, and also understand council's position as well too. Uh, and as officers, um, we're, we're very happy to be able to take direction from the table. Um, we put forward our recommendation. If that's somewhat different, um, we'll follow the decision that the council makes. Thank you. Okay. So through the chair, then, yeah. given the conversation around the legal matter, I will um, I will support the motion. Thank you. Mr. Stockwell, just close. Yeah, I think there's just a, a little bit of clarification required. Um, this isn't a matter about deciding to defend an appeal. No. This is a matter about um, settling a case contrary to the existing adopted position of the council. Now, I'm thinking back, I don't think we've had one of those this term. Uh, we might have had one. Certainly in the last term when we had one, it the same effect, we went into confidential session to discuss. Midi Street? Yeah. Midi Street. No, that was in this term, this we term? went to confidential. Oh, yeah. It was a 6-1, we turned around to 7-0 the end. Um, so that's why I, I do believe uh, uh, going into confidential session uh, we'll, we'll hope um, the open and transparent discussion from councillors, which would otherwise be constrained, uh, should it not be in uh, both sessions. Okay, I put the motion those in favour. That's unanimous. That item has moved to the end of the agenda. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, the next item is the Noosa Place Program, Pilot Place Selection. And we have. Um, a Director of Environment Strategic Planning, Kim Rawlings, and Principal Strategic Planner, Michelle Tucker, here. Welcome. Hello. Kim, Michelle, could you give us a, a bit of an overview on what we're looking at here, please? Yeah, sure. So the report um, we're presenting today really provides an outline of the place program to date over the past couple of years. Um, it includes um, the formation of an internal working group and a governance framework that we've initiated internally. Um, we've also undertaken initial community consultation through the livability survey, and that also helped us um, set up an evaluation and monitoring framework for the project moving forward. And finally, it provides a recommendation to the place pilot location that we will commence working on um, this year. Questions? Just like to um, foreshadow that I have a motion I would like to test with councillors, but before we do that, are there any questions for staff? Yep. Councillor Stewart. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, just reading it, I mean, this is a great program. Um, how long has the idea of a place-based program been in place? Uh, through the chair. Um, so council, I think, gave us uh, in their budget, I think in the 2019-2020 budget, to commence researching and establishing uh, future place-based program. Okay. So we've been on, um, working on the internal arrangements for some years now, trying to get the framework established and um, get the organisation prepared to commence a project. Yeah, okay. Just to add to that, um, the intention was that we would drop into sort of place-based um, planning at a local level once we completed the NUSA plan. Yeah. So the NUSA plan, you know, took shy a wide level planning. 
Um, and once that was completed, that we'd start to look in, into sort of that more localised, locality-based planning. Okay. So it's been about four years in the making, really. Yes. Yeah. Well, probably more than that. Yeah, so yeah. Just a question. So the extent of the ministerial conditions, which we've just got out of the way, is really taken those people who would otherwise have been able to concentrate on place making like the shell. That's a, that's correct. That was you know my, sort of what I was trying to infer around completing the NUSA plan. Mm. That we will, the intention was that would be complete by 2019, um, but we've got nearly three years worth of work from the ministerial conditions. Um, so there's been a bit of a pushback, even though we've been working on it. Um, not in a full-time capacity. And if I said to the community, started talking about placemaking, um, what, what is the simplest way to explain it to the community? Placemaking, what will it do for the area? What's the ultimate goal? I mean, because placemaking, people, well, what's that? What does that mean for me? Yeah. So for our for community, what does that mean for the community? Um, so through the chair, placemaking is really looking at um, a whole gambit of attributes that a place has and um, that's why we've commenced a livability survey because it's looking at um, a whole suite of community interventions, economic, environmental and social and cultural as well. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to take the approach, It's I guess it's not just new street trees, new street furniture, park mm -hmm. upgrades, it's, it's a whole lot more than that and it starts at a very high level and then drills down. Mm -hmm. It actually focuses on what the community values most within their mm -hmm. place what connections they have, what their experiences are, and then we, we focus in on those and look at, at how we can best work with the community. It's a community-led mm -hmm. process in delivering um, improved livability and overall place attraction. So bringing more people in, making it more livable, and improving the well-being of the community. And open spaces was very high. Protection and maintenance and enhancement mm -hmm. of our open and green spaces yes. was very high in our livability survey, wasn't it? Correct. So that would obviously feature in a big part of, yes. of place making. So, through the chair, um, environment and livability and open mm. space was a, a key value that community mm. rated across the Shire and their experience levels in that value were also very high. So we are doing a good job, but there's always room for improvement sure. and how we need to maintain that plus bring up other attributes as well is okay. what we will look at in terms of place. So Michelle, you're talking about a master plan um, for a precinct. It's a, it's a local area planning exercise with the community for their locality. But, uh, you know, looking at a whole range of, like Michelle said, attributes, whether it's physical attributes, open spaces, walkability through towns, social issues, business improvement. But yes, it is essentially a local area planning exercise. So I had a look at um, Logan together, just to get my head around what the end may look like. Um, so is there an opportunity? So Lo Logan together is the community just basically... Um, made a decision to have a collective goal, something of big impact, and theirs was to have um, healthy and happy youth kids um, for future generations. So the community banded together and that was their collective goal. Um, I'm imagining, is that an opportunity also for the precinct, that they come together and collectively have um, yeah. A goal um, and, and and we've had people in the community come to us and talk to us about the whole concept of intergenerational living and brain <coughs> schools um, those sorts of projects will that, will that possibly be tabled as unbelievable then um, I, I, I see the end and I think this is seriously exciting yeah Great. definitely plenty of opportunity for that yeah. fantastic it's about what comes from the community yeah and it provides a framework so they create their own future yes. simple as that yeah. Yeah. And the role of the community was considered the most important part of the criteria Absolutely. wasn't it yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic yeah. Joan, yeah. I want to suggest that it, uh, it looks at the commonality that all, re all um, localities may have but also the significant points of difference that make them unique and try to maintain that uniqueness or that uh, those qualities of that uh, that village uh, village area exactly yeah Following on from that, uh, following on from the Mayor's uh, point, um, you talked about um, ratings of things and all that. Where did those ratings uh, and, and that come from? What was the primary input for those ratings? So the primary input from those ratings was a livability survey that we undertook in conjunction with Place Score back in November 2021. And we did the whole shire that provided us a baseline across 50 attributes. Um, and that was statistically representative, even down to like um, town or village level. 
So we got an overall assessment from Noosa Shire, but we can also drill down into each of those localities and look at individually what the differences are, what the priorities are, what the opportunities are. Um, as you said, all communities are different, so they all value different things in different ways. So, so, so the question that that beggars in is, what weighting did the livability index score that is shown in the table on page six have in your decision as to which which locality to have as your pilot program? Um, so it basically provided us like the, the whole suite. Um, it really enabled us to look at each community individually and what their strengths were. Um, at the end of the day, um, it kind of just provides that supporting lens. I think for us it was more around community capacity and um, council's ongoing projects um, that kind of had the higher weighting. But it does provide us with, I guess, a general um, livability rating of a community in terms of, of moving forward, like what's the starting position and then how can we improve that and what's the a baseline. So. The reason I ask that question is because the uh, locality chosen is uh, rated fairly Yes. Fairly well in the livability yeah, right. yeah. mm. Councillor Stamuth, he's along the way oh, to move a motion, a please. Oh. Uh, you can ask the question. Um, you can ask the question now. It hasn't been seconded. Oh, thank you. Um, just to thank you for the work. It's been really good. Um, and it's great to see this get up and running in community. Can you just clarify for me? Um, you've done a development of place program framework. And then we're going into like the pilot place project selection location. Can you just clarify the difference between the program and then the project? Uh, so the program is really how we how we looked at place initially and set it up. So the government's arrangements, like what did we want to focus on and what did the place program look like for Noosa Council? So that was more internally what we what um, the keys and principles that we wanted to get out of it as an organisation um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. And then the pilot kind of is where we actually will now go and, and test that within the organisation as well as with the community to get the, the findings and the learning so we can roll that out hopefully okay. in the future. Right. Thank you. Well, we have a second to test this motion, please. Do you want to propose the motion? Um, that Council note the report by the Principal Strategic Planner to the General Committee meeting dated 13 February 2023. And A, approve Kin Kin to be the location of the pilot Noosa Place Program on the basis of need and to assist council develop robust placemaking program processes and B, approve Pomona to be the location for the first formal Noosa Place program. I'll second Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. I, Councillor, I fully expect this to be a 6-1 with me on the outer, but I have to <laughs> test this. Um, and I, ask with the, I begin with a question, and that is, who could reasonably begrudge the Shire's smallest and most distant community of Kin Kin, the village with the lowest livability score of the Shire, a community that has formally been requesting council assistance for integrated planning since 2007, becoming the site of a pilot placemaking program? Kin Kin has the greatest need for a broader, focused, future focused conversation, one that desperately needs to commence sooner rather than later, not because there are uncertainties and great difficulties, but precisely because there are. What we're deciding today is the most suitable community for the pilot or trial placemaking program, which will precede the first formal placemaking program. The pilot program is intended to road test the council's approach to placemaking to ensure a hardy and flexible model and processes that will most effectively benefit other communities. If we want a flexible and effective placemaking program, then the first community ought to be one that fully road tests all council's assumptions, where residents face arguably greatest, the greatest uncertainties and challenges, as well as demonstrating enormous desire to engage and shape their community's future. Kin Kin is also the most suitable for the pilot program because of its small size distant proximity, having the lowest livability score of all localities, the great volunteer work being done by the community to help itself, and its pleas for council's assistance and intervention that date back to the pre-amalgamation years. Kin Kin makes for the best trial site, not only because of the range of issues and proactive initiatives identified in a recent letter sent to council by the Kin Kin community group, but because of the divisive challenges Kin Kin faces 
in coexisting with the quarry over the past 15 years. The recent influx of new residents, including many young families as part of the COVID migration, and the purchase of most of the main street by a new landowner. More than any other community in the Shire, and on many fronts, Kin Kin is at a crossroads. This makes Kin Kin most suitable for program interventions to help the community steer itself to the future it desires. One which balances out all the conflicting realities and uncertainties. And the sooner this conversation formally begins within a structured, future-focused framework, the better. The seemingly intractable, intractable difficulties and uncertainties may also be seen by some as reasons to not firstly engage with Kin Kin. Equally, these difficulties are exactly why we ought to. It is not the easy thing, but the right thing in my view. This is where the community need for engagement and the opportunity to forge a robust placemaking program is the greatest. Councillors and officers will no doubt encounter challenges as well as goodwill in choosing to engage with Kin Kin. But with that comes the opportunity for deeper understanding of our most distant village community and the opportunity to develop the best, most robust placemaking program model. And looking ahead, council, residents and ratepayers also need to know if the placemaking program has been effective or not. As the report states, the council will be monitoring and evaluating the success of programs into the future using the National Livability Index score as a benchmark. Out of 100, the average score for Noosa Shire was 70, and the national average for all Australian communities was 78, 68. Pomona scored above the national and Shire average on 71, while Kin Kin lagged well behind on a score of 58, well below all other Noosa communities and the national average. The community need inherent in this low score is one we cannot ignore. As far back as 2007, the community group wrote to council begging for an integrated council-led process to help Kin Kin develop into the place that reflected the community's aspirations and sound environmental principles. If the council is serious about wanting to use improvements in the livability score as a benchmark for the place program effectiveness, then using Kin Kin's low score of 58 as a benchmark offers the greatest ability to detect changes rather than using Pomona, a township that is already above the national and shire average for livability. Page eight of the report lists Kin Kin, Pomona and Tawantan as the highest ranking candidates for placemaking, taking into consideration a range of criteria. Need, as demonstrated by the livability score, was one. The other criteria, community capacity, the existence of community leadership, and alignment with Council's current strategic priorities, in my view, favour the larger communities. Pomona has a much greater number of service providers, volunteer groups, a community house providing counselling and access to a range of support networks, an iconic event in the King of the Mountain, diverse and colourful events staged at the Majestic Theatre, an art gallery and regular, highly successful market markets, successful new businesses, and is being linked to Koran with a $1 million investment in the trail network. It is a thriving community with its challenges, which also clearly could benefit from a placemaking program, as could others across the Shire. In Pomona, there are issues including parking, increased traffic, pathway and signage links to, through and from key sites and parks, opportunity for use of the Queensland rail land, upgrades to the trail network and the future of the Pomona showgrounds, grounds, all of which are valid and arguably worthy of a placemaking program that is mature and robust and has been effectively argued for, in particular, by one passionate Pomona advocate. Page 11 of the report lists the reasons why, all up, why, with all other things being equal, staff recommend Pomona to be the trial placemaking location. Arguably, all these reasons also support Kin Kin as suitable for the trial. Both Pomona and Kin Kin are locations that have key strengths and aspects that could benefit from the place-based approach. Engaging with Pomona or Kin Kin would allow the staff to increase their skills, the organisation to adapt and the community to realise benefits. A community requiring a higher degree of change or support 
or one that is larger or more complex was said to be unlikely to benefit from a pilot when the organisation is still in the early stages of applying placemaking and being able to implement it. Arguably, Pomona is larger and more complex. Smaller is therefore better for a pilot. The PLACE program would build on current activity and momentum, particularly in the main centre areas of Pomona. As a more developed, larger and evolving town, there is certainly more momentum and activity in Pomona. This is what Kim Kim is hoping to develop with the Council's help. As listed in the Kim Kim Community Group's request list of proactive initiatives provided to councillors and staff recently, there is proportionally as much momentum and activity in the smaller village. Kin Kin Community Group's letter requests Council's help in addressing a full range of issues, including signage, streetscaping, parking and shade, skate park upgrades, a future focused approach to the historic challenges and division caused by the quarry, addressing risks to the isolated community posed by flood and other disasters, formalising camping regulations, improving shower and toilet facilities to match Kin Kin's role in the Noosa Biosphere Trail Network, living with flying foxes, activating the School of Arts Hall and Community House upgrading post and rail, public drinking fountains, etc. The report says there needs to be existing business and community leaders in the region and community groups using the features of place to bring community together. Pomona is certainly well advanced in this area and Kin Kin, with a landowner having purchased most of the main street, would most benefit from the timely intervention of a placemaking program to help ensure the town evolves according to shared ideas of identity and place. Kin Kin and Pomona are also both becoming more used by residents outside of the immediate townships. Pomona does have more planned and resourced projects in the location that could be in included as part of the place project. And equally, Kin Kin's smaller number of planned projects make it suitable for a starter pilot project. The report says the village needs to be of a size and scale that would allow for meaningful monitoring and evaluation of outcomes for a pilot. Again, Kin Kim's smaller size and lower livability score make it more suitable for a trial. The report says that although Pomona achieved a good livability score, there are a number of broader issues that could benefit from an integrated place-based approach being applied, for example, environmental, economic and social. Kin Kin had a lower score and clearly also could benefit from an integrated place-based approach being applied to environmental, economic and social issues. Almost finished, Councillor. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. I'm just wondering if you've actually got the watch on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, I'm finished, I'm letting it go just as long as the net of your mind have ever been. <laughs> it's a, Pomona and Kin Kin both have quickly experienced a variety of changes through COVID that would benefit from a place-based program to ensure ongoing co community cohesion. Long-term Kin Kin residents at the recent Christmas event were remarkably positive about the massive influx of younger families to Kin Kin who love the lifestyle and want to shape and preserve it. Pomona and Kin Kin both have had growth in tourism visitors, particularly through the drive market. Turnover in and changing makeup of population, increase of people experiencing cost of living pressures and an increase in social issues. So if the thriving township of Pomona is to be the first formal placemaking location that will benefit from a robust placemaking model, then for all the above reasons, who could reasonably begrudge the Shire's smallest and most distant community of King Kim, the village that has been requesting an integrated planning assistance since 2007, with the lowest livability score becoming the site of a pilot placemaking program? Thank you for listening. No question. Questions, uh, Councillor Stockwell and Councillor Stewart. So, my questions of the director obviously, Councillor Wilkie's put a, a, a range of reasons why you would go for King Kim, and you've obviously had most of those in your, if not all, in your purview. So from your perspective, um, you've recommended Pomona. What were the key differences that would lead you to believe that Pomona is a more um, appropriate place to pilot the package? Mm. You can see why it's taken us four years. <laughs> 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 location. Four years and 25 minutes of that. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it hasn't been an easy process to to weigh up all of these localities because every locality has 
um, needs and, and strengths and could benefit from you know local area place-based intervention and, and council support we know that lots of communities are ready are ready for it um, uh, We've, we've been through a very rigorous process, um, mainly internally with all of the organisations. So we've had you know, hours and days of workshops with about 40 people across the organisation involved who are people who are out in the community um, from all of the um, service areas of the organisation understanding um, you know, what's happening in each, in each of those localities to consider um, and come up with the recommendation. There's no doubt that King King, Tawantan and Pomona were the top three localities that, that when, when all things considered, um, would any of those would be great pilot locations. Um, I guess we, it wasn't just from a needs basis, it was also from a strengths basis that we came up with the, the pilot location. Um, we want a pilot location you know, and I need to step through this very sensitively because each locality has got strengths, and you know, and I don't, for one minute, seem want to infer that mm. one is stronger over the other. They're, they're diverse communities with, with strengths and, and, and opportunities. Um, but you know, for Pomona, it, it was of a, of a scale that we thought we could test a whole range of approaches. Um, there was uh, there's lots of alignment uh, with with the work that's already happening in the organisation. Um, it has a very, very organised and active community, which is very, is fundamental mm -hmm. to the success uh, of a pilot, um, of, a, of a place program. So, you know, it was about weighing up those things. Um, and, you know, it was, it was marginal uh, in terms of where, where, what we're recommending. Okay. Councillor Stewart, you had a question. So, since 2007, there's been pleas for council assistance from Kin Kin. Is that what you said, Councillor Wookie? Yes. I'm just wondering why in, in six, what's that, 13, 16 years, um, I guess that hasn't, why those pleas haven't been answered in, in since 2007, or has there been done things done since then? I know certainly with this council, since 2020, we've been actively supporting them in a, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a court case, so we should. I'm just wondering what else has been done since 2007, if anything, to get them to the point where this is the place making, um, you know, this is the, the basis of Councillor Walkie's argument for place making there. Mm. Uh, many localities have, have um, requested council support in place based mm -hmm. um, approaches. Noosa Junction's done place mm -hmm. making framework, uh, Pomona's done, done work, uh, Sun, Sunshine have asked Nooseville, you know, so lots of places have been asking for councils. Um, support through a local area place based approach for the last um, you know five or ten years which is why you know four years ago council decided that this would mm. be a program that we would introduce a new a new service a new new approach um, for, for communities there's been lots of investment and intervention in these localities mm. there's been lots of work happening in kink in so it's not it's not as if because of the place programs not there that they, these communities mm. aren't supported by council all our communities are supported by council mm. all our communities have capital investment um, and Michelle's actually done you know as part of the process we've actually done a, a very rigor, rigorous analysis of the investment that has happened in localities over the last so, so the pleas five years. for council assistance have been answered in many respects yeah in many respects but not in a not through a place based short sure, just through a yeah. normal council yeah absolutely business. but they haven't been certainly yet so that they've certainly been heard and and acted upon can just stop it yeah i think we're getting debates so i'm going to move an amendment uh it's as written except replacing kin kin and a with pomona this, this is a reversal of my mm -hmm. a, a negation yeah it's, it's, a negation. it's not a negation no it's a reversal. No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's a reversal. I'll, I'll, I'll okay, finish I'll, your, finish your. How about, how about we hear it first? Um, I'd say Pomona in A, Kinkin and Twanton in B. That's where it's where it's in That's in the first and second. That's the start. That's the start of the motion. Yeah. I'm, I'm moving an amendment to your motion. I don't believe it's a negation because it's just changing the priority. I, I disagree. It is 
it is a direct negation, a, di a reversal of the motion. You're the chairman, you can say that, I won't Check argue. Yeah. But I, I disagree. It's a, it's a change in, in priority. It's the, and priority is integral to the, the purpose of the motion. So I will, it's a direct negation okay. of the motion. Can we, can we test it on its merits? The motion on its merits. Okay. I was just trying to tell you, save you a 6 1. <laughs> I'm up for the 6 1, Brian. I'm so, yeah, I'll, a... I'll, I'll speak briefly to it then. You don't, you want to no, no, he's ruled that it's, 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 okay. it's out of order. So, I'll, I'll accept the chairman's ruling Perfect. on this occasion. <laughs> um, the council book is out, identified a whole lot of good reasons. Um, some of those reasons are exactly the re and, and I don't want to get the debate into which is more needy. And I think both are in need. Um, but some of those reasons are exactly why they wouldn't make a good pilot. Because Kinkin's size, the nature of their problems, and the nature of their community is unique to Kinkin. Uh, and um, for that reason, um, it would, in my opinion, be a, a, a not an optimal um, township to go with. Uh, the Pomona has a range of issues that, that have to be resolved locally, but have regional significance, which do provide an indicator for other local place making, which may help us um, uh, in a range of ways. And um, I just think that. Uh, the staff recommendation has got it right. Question, um, has there been any sort of master planning done in Pomona previously? Yes, yeah, there was a architectural report. Um, it was a master plan. Yeah, long time ago, yes. maybe a decade ago. Yeah. 2015. Yeah. 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 I believe, I'd have to check this, but I believe it was done in response to a development application that was proposed there. Um, oh, the yeah. it was, was the supermarket. The supermarket, yeah. 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 And because there was some range of issues around the supermarket, there was a bit of a master planning process done yeah. okay. to try and resolve some of those. And my second question is, was there been a master planning process of anything up at Not that I'm aware of. Joe, question. I was going to ask a question in a different way. Has there been any other master planning processes for any other localities been undertaken in the past? Through the chair, there's been plenty. Yeah. Yeah, a um, whole raft across the Shire, Nisa Junction, um, Sunshine Beach, Bridgian Beach. Um, I have to go back and check. Two wise had a motion. The whole story is different. Okay. And I guess there's master plans, there's streetscapes, there's a whole range of things that all fall under that umbrella. Yeah. And this is oh, I, won't, I won't go into delivery on those. <laughs> Mr. CEO, question for you. With regard to the current um, court action being undertaken, or to know the quarry plan, do we have any dates or any proposed? No. Any no. Excuse me, I'm asking the CEO. Sorry. Are there any, any known dates or how long could that process be ongoing? Through the Chair, Councillor Jurisovic, uh, it is before His Honour for decision and we await His Honour's um, finalisation and deliberation of the decision to be handed down. Is there any, any time, time frame associated with that? No, there's not. Right, thank you. That's the reason for asking the question. It's to put into the, into the discussion. Thank you. Um, I have a question yes, through the Chair. Yeah. Uh, Kim... Uh, what is the um, cost of the PLACE program? Um, what is the community expected to have injected in terms of dollars um, into their community? And has that money been already allocated and budgeted for? Um, yes, through the Chair. Um, there is some budget allocation within existing um, budgets uh, that Council have already allocated. Um, both the resource and Michelle is, is dedicated to the place program so the community can expect to work with Michelle and have Michelle in place. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and Michelle will be supported across the organisation. So the key to this success is that there is cross-organisational involvement 
from all our areas, you know, our transport area, our parks and open space, our economic development areas, our strategy areas, you know, development assessment. Um, that, so there's a, there's a cross-organisational group that will also be involved um, in, in the location. And then there is an allocation of funding to support the planning process and the community engagement process um, that, can, that Council has put aside. Um, where we will get some support for the community to run a, a local area planning exercise that identifies all the things that you, you sort of mentioned before. What are the issues in the community? What are the things the community would like fixed? Um, what's the long-term aspirations? What's the future vision for, for the place? To come up with a framework that might be a 10-year framework for that place. Um, and also as part of those discussions is, okay, how are we going to pay for this and who's going to pay? So uh, that's part of the planning, so that there's a local area plan with an implementation plan and funding and ways of delivering against those things. Not, all, not everything needs funding to achieve outcomes, um, but you know, different mechanisms to fund uh, the implementation of that, that plan will be uh, identified too. Um, it's important to go into these um, processes being very clear to manage expectations that to achieve this 10 year plan, and wish this, it can't just rely on council funding. There has to be some alternative sources of funding. You know, and there are grants available um, to support place breaking. You know, there's lots, private investment achieves lots of things in, in local areas. Community investment, Government you know, hours and of volunteer investment. Yeah. Mm. You know, so there's a range of ways to achieve yeah. these outcomes. Fantastic, thank you. But also one of the other outcomes of something like this would be to prioritise the community the community's priorities yes. with regard to what they see as the principal and primary focus of Council's uh, attention would be year one, year two, exactly. and, and so on and so forth. What are the, uh, the things that they would see as the greatest elements of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, trying to think of a word, uh, of, of input, of, uh, of value to, uh, to that community. Look, I'm gonna, I'll talk to him. Yeah, I'll talk to him. Thank you for placing us between a rock and a hard place, Councillor Wilkie. <laughs> <laughs> um, without wanting to sound um, unfeeling or uncaring for all the points that you've outlined with regard to King King, I see the rhyme and reason that staff have chosen the priorities that they have. I understand the needs in King King, but King King has got a major focus at the mo at the moment, and I think um, um, until that, uh, uh, that that outcome of that court case is there, I think that's that to me would uh, be best carried out after that process has been undertaken. Because I think you could have a large bearing on placemaking in Kinky and an understanding of what's needed going forward. Um, I also understand the size and scale of a of a locality like Pomona. Um, is the reason that staff have chosen it. Because um, if you start on a smaller scale, there may be some things that you don't consider when looking at larger localities or that come into, come into play. So as a pilot, something that has or will take in most of the parameters that you'd be looking at across the region um, would be the reason you would select a locality such as Pomona. Look, I would, I would argue in the same vein for Tawantan, I would argue in the same vein for Boring Point, Lake Catharaba and Ringtail Creek. All of these communities have, over the, my time here and before my time on council, advocated to council for um, elements to improve and enhance their communities. And as the Mayor alluded to, some of those have been, you know, it's been a question, some of those things have been delivered. But a lot yet still are to be delivered. Trying to get it right, as we have a, you know, transitioning communities, those priorities do change over time as well. As we have a growing community, as we have in Pomona, we've got a significant uh, amount of growth in Pomona and Karoi, uh, uh, as, as in all localities, uh, and a lot of pressures that are being being held on. So, um, like I said, not wanting to sound uncaring and unfeeling towards the people of Kinkin, I think getting the process right in a slightly larger locality in the first instance, and then once we have that process down pat, focusing on a township such as Kinkin, might be the better process to go as the staff have alluded to. Um, I said, I, you know, I, I, I can attest to it, having been advocated to by people in Karend, by people in Tawantan, by people in Timbiwa, Boring Point. So every, every one of these localities has, 
has, has been on our agenda and had, had elements that have, uh, have needed to be done. And I, I don't disagree with any of the points that you've raised there, Councillor, uh, Councillor Wilkie. Thank you, I think, and I think yeah. your, your impassioned plea for Kim Kim to be considered as the pilot place is, uh, is, is a laudable, is a laudable request. I, I didn't want it to be laudable, I hoped it to be effective. <laughs> <laughs> Speak with Lord. <laughs> 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 yeah, Amendment Stewart. 1, sorry, is that... Is no, that no, that's that's, yeah, right, so that's off the table. Yeah, yeah, table. Oh, thank yeah. you. So, yeah, thank you. So we can get rid of that. Yeah. Does it need to be recorded in the minutes? I think it does. It, it will need to be recorded yeah, and it'll be that the but chair it says exactly the same thing. Yeah, the, the chair, chair rule is to be... It's got Pomona instead of Kim Kim. But it, it, says, it says the same thing, it's just swapped A and B to yours. Yeah, yes. I know, but he's ruled exactly that it's reversed. Yeah, I would have had to move that I descended the chairman's ruling and mm. I couldn't do that. I couldn't probably have their CEO on his side that I was going to lose. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Wigan. I applaud your advocacy, Councillor Wilkie. That was fantastic. Um, Placemaking has been before the council and staff for our entire term so far. And uh, I'm very, very confident that that choice of Pomona is very well considered. Um, except for had it not been for this, the bad situation had it been, hadn't been fixed so well, then that might have changed the, the weighting of things. But no, that, that the new clubhouse is, is, is done. Um, I would say that what, one of the things is I think you want a bit of stability in an area in order for the placemaking to work. And Kim Kin is on the boil right now. It is all happening out there. Um, there's big changes going on. I mean, for example, Matt Kalinsky is the new chef at the Kim Kin Hotel. And that is going to make big changes, obviously, with, with the whole town, with even the identity of the town, where it's gone from one to all of a sudden the best chef you know in the world probably yeah. <laughs> um, and so emotions are running hot and I've, and I've been out there quite a bit and people talk about that they say oh you know the new owners here they're going to do this and they're going to do that and now Mac Lindsay's going to come and the town's ruined and you know I just I, I agree that stability is is actually really important in a town it, just wait for the Wait for things to settle just that little bit. Have, have the, the new owner in the Kin Kin pub, let them go down their, their track with what they want to do. The, the Kin Kin markets are expanding, you know, fantastically. That's happening out there. There is just so much going on. It's a great place to invest, probably. Uh, but I don't know if we want to invest with our, um, with our placemaking there to begin with. I'd be very, very happy that it be cut that is. Number two, I'd be very happy if they really, really learn about how placemaking works in Pomona so that they can evolve into that program and, and absorb it into Kin Kin, the learnings from it. But as for now, I, I support um, a staff's decision that, uh, to stick with Pomona. I'll submit you. Thank you. Um, this has been a really tough one because I think that when I read the requirements in the report, page four says, a successful place-based approach is reliant on clear goals, strong community ownership, leadership and facilitation. As all places are different, place-based programs need to be tailored to reflect the specific scale, status, role and resources of the place. I would say that it's safe to say that we have all those attributes across all of our various locations in Noosa Shire, that it's not exclusive just to one area. So it's been a very hard choice. And similarly on page seven, the agenda notes the three most important things a placemaking pilot community should have response and responses include a strong sense of community ownership and community buy-in, the need for a place intervention in the community, community engagement, coordination and collaboration across the community, sustainability. So again, I think that this that answers the question for very all areas of our community. Um, I think you know they're all really warranted um, for place making. Um, I think we, this has been, as we've heard from the staff, four years. You've spent hundreds of hours on this. You've had many, many staff on this. You've said you've been out and about in the community. You've had workshops. This has been a really long, detailed process that you haven't taken lightly. So I think, you know, it's, as, a, as all councillors, it's, it's very hard, you know, because every, we want this to happen in every location. And if we could wave that magic wand and we have those funds, it would. Uh, I think that Pomona is based on, you know, what I've just said. Um, it is 
in expert opinion and, and staff who have been working on this for a period of four years, if not more, if that's your determination, I think um, that, that we should support that. I certainly think Kin Kin is very worthy and I'm, I look forward to um, you know, hopefully seeing that, that them being the beneficiary of the next um, place making and to Wanton and Coran. I mean, there's so many areas, as I said, um, but we do have a finite amount of resources. Um, we have a finite amount of funds. This has been targeted and highlighted as the overall uh, re recipient or when I say, um, fr from our council staff. Um, and I think that we should, and, uh, and I will support it certainly because um, there's a lot of work that's gone into this report, not just this report, but obviously clearly all the work you've been doing on the ground. Uh, I'm really proud of this council. We've really supported the King King community. We'll continue to do that. There is still uncertainty. Joe, you know, as you've just heard, we, you know, we don't have a date for that court case. Um, so that is something that, you know, we're waiting on with bated breath with everyone else. So I think that down the track, you know, we'll have, once the outcome of that is known, we'll have a better understanding of the needs in that area and we'll be able to act upon those needs. But I think what we should take away and what the community should take away is that we're, although Pomona will be the first and I think they're a really worthy recipient, we support all areas of the community uh, and are looking forward to doing this, whether or not it takes another few years, five years, whatever, but every, hopefully, every area will win a prize yeah, at some point or you know, be able to be really um, heavily involved in this placemaking. Thank you. Just a question of staff. Um, you said previously that it was very marginal between Kinkin and Pomona. If, if um, through a miracle, councils here today decided that Kinkin is the first, is that a pivot the council could easily, staff could easily manage? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the location. Yeah, and that's the, lo that's the yeah. location. Yeah. You know, many locations are worthy. All yeah. locations are yeah. worthy. And you know, because it's a very local approach, um, it works with the strengths and needs of each locality. So it's a, it is adaptable to, to various locations. We'd like, we would like to test it in a location and refine it, um, both for the community and get them to help us refine the process and for the organisation. You know, hence why we, we, we are strongly suggesting a pilot location to do that before it's rolled out across the shop. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Um, the Noosa Place pilot program, the report we've got in front of us, um, it's not a competition. Um, and there's not only one winner. If this pilot is successful, then placemaking program will be rolled out to all towns. Everyone wins. Because every town in this shire is deserving for placemaking interventions. Tawantan, Kinkin, the North Shore, Tiwa, Sunrise Beach, Marcus, Federal, Black Mountain, to name a few. The purpose of this pilot is to test its viability, what works and what doesn't work, and to provide those learnings to future implementations so that every town in this shire is set up for success. Today is about getting started, picking one town and getting a program that started in 2019 off the ground. It's not about pitting one town against another. I do not support the motion in front of us, but I wholly support the people and businesses of Kin Kin, as does Council. The staff have gone through due process and due diligence, and I support their recommendation to approve Pomona as the location for the first place program pilot. And that next year, 12 months down the track, Kin Kin and Tawantan have been identified as the next two townships for place making interventions and then every other town in the Shire, um, because um, there is so much to gain from this place program and every town is deserving. I thank the staff um, for their serious hard work. Um, I know the decision has been really difficult, um, as it is for us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really difficult sitting here to, saying that I proved Pomona over Kin Kin. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the case. We're, we're yeah. just, we're getting it off the ground um, everyone gets a prize.
I'm looking forward Can to the budget. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'd like to thank the staff and, and the councillors. It is a really difficult decision. Um, being a long-term resident of the hinterland, it's even more challenging <laughs> because I see the whole hinterland as, as my home and, um, you know, I've got <coughs> really close connections with each one of those communities, so it's really hard. But, you know, I look at this as the opportunity to, um, you know, select a location and that we can move forward on that to collect the data to inform our decisions moving forward. Um, and I think also when you look at it, we need to discuss and look at community resilience and communities' own ability to, you know, solve their own problems and have capacity and capability, which is supported by council through me many various ways to um, meet the challenges. And, and what I really love across the Shire is that we have these really resilient communities with really good leadership capacity and they're engaged. So I don't think that, you know, people are going to miss out because they don't get chosen for the first place making. Um, I'm happy to recommend, um, I'll accept the staff recommendation. Um, the motion today put forward by Councillor Wilkie has been like well spoken and um, I hear your arguments. Um, but I think moving forward, uh, I think I'll stick with the staff recommendation and we can just get it underway and we can use that data to better inform, you know, the towns that are coming, communities that are coming next. So um, I think it's exciting mm. and, um, you know, everybody's been looking forward to this for so long and I think just to get something off the ground, um, get community engaged, get some data um, so that we can make some really informed decisions for all communities across the Shire. So I think it's a good day mm. um, and it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Finsell. Councillor, thank you very much for uh, testing that, that motion. I had to do it. Um, uh, look, <laughs> Kin Kin is the little sister of all the hinterland communities. And I do say again, I believe it is, provides the best opportunity to road test the pilot, a pilot program to ensure that when it is rolled out to all other communities across the Shire, it is robust and flexible because of the uncertainties and difficulties faced by the component community. Uh, they're unlike any other, and I think that really will test the model to its fullest. Um, I'd like to point out there is a feeling that there is a, an e all communities are on an equal par, and that is true. We, we value all our hinterland and coastal communities. But the difference between them, all them, and Kin Kin is that Kin Kin has by far, by far the lowest livability score of all our communities. And implied, inherent in that is a great need. And also, Kin Kin is about the only community that's never had any form of integrated planning. There are master plans, community plans, and local area plans for a host of other communities across the Shire. Kin Kin is unique in that regard. The quarry was raised. There are so many voices in Kin Kin saying our community is so much more. There are so many more issues out there than just the quarry. And the uncertainty and difficulties that uh, are related to that are likely to be ongoing regardless of the finding of the court case. And so a future focus the sooner a future focused conversation can happen out in that community, the better. And a, a place-based making program pilot is ideal for that. Um, Councillor Wigginer was spot on when he said Kin Kin is hot at the moment. There are a lot of hot issues. There's a lot of change happening. There's a lot of conversations happening. Um, but I think that's another reason why we shouldn't shy away from Kin Kin. I believe that's a reason why we ought to engage uh, and have council facilitate a future focused conversation and draw all those threads together sooner rather than later. But uh, I thank the councillors for uh, testing this, this motion and uh, I'll accept the majority decision and thank you um, staff for all the work you've done on bringing this place making program to where it is today. I'll put the motion to those in favour. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Almost got <laughs> <laughs> Councillor, oh, Councillor Wilkie <laughs> against. <laughs> Councillor Finzel, Stockwell, Jerusovic, Lawrence and 
Stewart and Wegener. The motion is lost. And I'd like Councillor Stockwell. I'd like to move the staff recommendation with a B. And the B to read. Okay, just bear with me a second while I change. So we want. A. Yep. Approve Mona and B. Approve Kinkin. Then Tawanton as the next two priorities for the placemaking program. I'll second it. I do so. Um, second the Councillor Stewart. Um, Councillor Joe talked about being between a rock and a hard place. In fact, there's, there's, uh, the debate's between two really deserving places. Uh, neither of them are hard. They're both very fun and nice. But I haven't got four pages of speaking notes. I've got 12 points. I really love it that you speak so by record. So it's for 25 minutes anyway. Then. Yeah, he's got the slideshow. <laughs> I would have had a slideshow for a moment, but my computer <laughs> can't have on the weekend. Point of order, Councillor. Sorry, sorry, I'll reprimand myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, place making. Local area planning, what is it? I'm going to use French and Latin to explain it. So the raison d'etre of placemaking is genius loci, understanding it and planning for how it's embedded into the future. Genius loci is Latin for the, that prevailing character or atmosphere of a place. It's about the presiding spirit of the place. And that's what you're trying to do by engaging the locals. You're trying to say, what is it about Pomona? What is it about Kinkin that makes it what it is? We've already got a fair idea about what it is in Pomona because we've had lots of submissions. And if we look at one of the drivers, one of the drivers is we actually made a commitment when we uh, went out to public consultation on Noosa Plan 2020 and we got a, a whole lot of submissions around the character of Pomona. People who wanted more protection to increase the character overlay. So one of the real centre of attention for Pomona is about the character that makes Pomona Pomona. And that is one of the big things that the placemaking strategy will do. The second most important thing for me, however, is urban growth. What many people don't realise is probably the biggest area of undeveloped area within the SEQ Regional Plan's urban footprint in our Shire is around Pomona. There's lots and lots of areas that are, are within the eyesight of the region as being suitable for development. But we know at a local area they've got constraints of flooding, of bushfire and of high environmental value. So that's another thing that we can do in a local area plan. We can come around and say, well, where is it realistic within Pomona that retains the character, retains the environment, avoids the hazards to develop? Which is really, really important at the moment because if we look at affordability and social housing, that town probably offers some of the biggest opportunities in the future. Because it is a little bit more affordable, it has its own primary school and high school, it has its own shopping centre, and at the moment it has medical facilities. So using placemaking to get the community to understand what the future urban development, what the future growth looks like for Mona, I say is really current and urgent. It should be in a position so that we can inform the current review of the regional plan in case the state government tries to come over the top and exercise its, its, its desire to uh, um, have, see more vacant lots created. So that's number three. But we've got other local issues that are really good to understand. As I mentioned, Pone's got a high school, but it's probably the only high school which hasn't got a pedestrian or bikeway connection to the town pretty poorly connected. So one of the things that this local area planning will do will show what that network is, how people are going to get across, whether it's kids or whether it's old people, whether it's young people, how do they navigate without getting into the car. So that pedestrian and cycle activity, how do we link all those missing links together? The other thing the mate has got is waterways and flood plains um, with endangered vegetation and vulnerable species that come right through town. 
but just at the bottom of the main street, up 100 metres, there's an endangered ecosystem. We've got vulnerable fogs, both within the main creek and in the tributaries, which we know is one of the areas being developed. And we know there's probably rehabilitation and getting the local community to have a vision in mind about what those waterways should look like in the future and therefore inform how we make decisions both to invest in environment levy but also to condition development is another one. When we look at that creek, we can see that at the bottom of the main street we've got gravel where cars park. In the middle of town, we've got weeds. We've got this area which should be water sensitive urban design best practice, where we don't just cut pits into the turf to drain water, where we have really well designed. So looking at the town, there's really opportunities to focus on urban design, how it, uh, we create shade with the trees to, create, to make it more of a suitable for the environment. We look at how we, we treat water within an urban environment such that we filter as we go through. We don't put sediment laid, laden runoff through our channels. We talked about the Noosa Trail Master Plan. King Kinsley. The actual master plan talks about Pomona being the hub, being the, the bike village of the whole what we now call the biosphere network. So how do we look at that? What does that what what are the future opportunities and what are the future infrastructure requirements that will help create that vibe in Pomona. We've also got some pretty classical urban design open space planning things. Dan Topper Park, while it's used you know, well for King of the Mountain and for the markets, it's probably about 50 years out of date in terms of landscaping. We know we've had presentations from the fun. university students that come up here. It's a real opportunity to make that the village green that really makes living in Pomona that step above. So that's another one, the open space planning that you can do at a local area scale. But it's also got heritage assets. Is the Majestic the last remaining talking picture movie theatre used to be Southern Hemisphere? I had a feeling it might be in the world. We've got the Shire Museum and we've got things like the, the old um, Mason's building. So you've got that. You've also got the, the Shire's showground which is a not-for-profit community organisation which has so much potential that should be linked into that community. But at the moment, it's been asking for the master planning, but it should be part of that community. Because I've lived there up until recently, it's also got a mob of grey kangaroos that you can find at the top of the main street or around the back of any of the suburbs. So it's still got that country town feel that you really have to work out, well, how are we going to manage that to retain that? But I think where we've got to in terms of the difference between, say, Kingston and Taunton, is that we've got this mix of good community groups. In, you know, you've got the Lions who organise the King of the Mountain, you've got the Pomona Market Group and the Art Gallery, you've got Noosa Lanka, you've got a whole range of groups with really good capacity to engage. And that's why I think it makes the superior pilot site. Mm. I have a question. Come in. Um, just in terms of the um, amendment in front of us, approve Kin Kin, then to Wanton. So, um, as the next two priorities, the report actually states that there's opportunity to run both at the same time. Um, that's if we make the decision to allocate the dedicated resource. The amendment in front of us, does that... An amendment to motion. Uh, sorry, the motion in front of us, approve Kin Kin, then to Wanton. I read that, and maybe the question is to you, Brian, um, as Kin Kin having priority over to Wanton. Um, and does that exclude the opportunity of running both placemaking programs at the same time? So, um, yes and no. So yes, yeah. um, it's worded so it goes one, two, three. Yep. Um, no, it's up to us mm -hmm. to allocate the budget and I would be arguing that they both get funded in the next financial year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Councillor Brian. Stockwell's spoken to his motion. Any other councillors wish to speak? Um, I, no, I'll just, because I seconded it, I'll, I'll support it. Um, I think, you know, Councillor Stockwell, you may not have been 25 minutes, but you gave it a good crack. <laughs> <laughs> But I think I think you summed it up well. Um, I think you know I think Pomona is a terrific pilot place, um, and Kinkin Kin and Tawantan are also very worthy, as we've all discussed. Councillor Wilkie's talking to the talk to the merits of Kinkin, Kin. uh, and I, again I come back to that this isn't 
Um, this isn't. This is about the whole of Shire, uh, and this is about, as Councillor Lawrence said, this is about starting off. And I think it's fantastic that we are making that start, and uh, and we will get there, and we will get around the whole Shire. But we have to start somewhere, and this is a good place. So I support it. Thank you. Tom, uh, maybe a question to staff. I mean, we're, we're talking about Pomona today. That that's our focus. Um, I just think it's, it's, it's premature and um, to tell you what to do, to just say, okay, kid and kid and then just want the next, when it hasn't really, it's not really in the report and it hasn't been discussed. Is it premature to, to make such a call now? Well, the report does talk about King Kin and Swanton as okay. being the other hmm. host locations that were under consideration for the pilot. We specifically didn't make the recommendation for those, though, because we want to do the pilot program. We want to see what the program brings, what learnings, um, what insights, so that council can consider the next location in the context of the learnings and insights mm. of the pilot. Yeah, I, I would. I, I think. Could, could there be kind of pushback from the community saying, "Hey, you know, you just made this decision." With, you know, without consultation or without, yeah, kind of just just on the on the fly. Maybe just, that's not that's not much of a question. Maybe that, just an answer, an, an answer to your question, Tom. In the page twelve of the staff report says consideration uh, could be given to running the two locations, Kinkin Kin and Tawanta, in the same year. However, additional resources would be required, and they're saying after Pomona, for the next. Proposed future schedule would be Kinkin and Kinawant to Wanton, and Kinkin and Tawant could be run consecutively if the resources were there. So there is okay, reference yeah, to yeah. that in the report. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, At the top of page 12, yeah. the yeah. paragraph actually clearly yeah. states Kinkin 1 to Wanton 2 was the next, next uh, resource. Right, okay, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll speak to it. Um, I support the motion. That's been proposed by <coughs> Council Stockwell. Um, Noosa Place Program, if I've got to sort of dumb it down, it's people-centred planning. Um, and I think this is just a tremendous opportunity for the people of Pomona to tackle both opportunities and challenges that are facing mm -hmm. Pomona. And we've heard some of those around the table. I want to add to that list um, intergenerational changes and disadvantage. Um, demographic shifts that we're seeing in Pomona and um, tourism. Mm -hmm. um, so as a council and a councillor, I think this is just a really great opportunity to see these issues from a local perspective and then for us to share the control and accountability with the Pomona community and the Pomona organisations. Um, this is how we genuinely build resilient and strong communities, by giving a community a sense of over ownership over decisions that are made specifically for them. Um, this is a test pilot place program and it's important to note, um, and, and that's why I love the addition of B, which um, clearly identifies Kin Kin and Tuonton as next in place. Um, also want to add that after Kin Kin and Tawantan, then every other community village will um, also have the advantage of a place-based program. Um, finally, just want to take this opportunity again to thank the staff for, the com for their commitment to this project. Um, and also want to thank our community leaders for their passion and commitment to placemaking. Um, I think a few names really pop in mind. Um, so thank you for keeping the flame alive for all of us. Joe, Always difficult to turn around after having come from Canberra, which was a place that was designed from the start, created from the start, to see how we go about fixing things that are legacies of the past in some, some instances and enhancing and improving the needs and wants of, uh, of each individual community going forward. Um, it's not as though you've got a blank piece of paper to start with, you've actually got stuff in place. And some of those things are challenging. Karoi, Pomona and Karan all have a railway 
going through the middle of the towns, which are a legacy of the past. Is that something we want to see in the future? Is that something the community wants to see in the future? What's the uh, state government got in, uh, in mind for the future of the, uh, the railway through those towns? I mean, there is some planning going on and some discussion around that. Those sort of, those sort of things are all, are all the sort of challenges and things that we can, we can take into being. Curve and guttering, urban, urban symbols, do they want to be seen in, in, uh, in, um, in our rural townships, our, our, in our villages? Pathways, you know, where are pathways best gone? What are the elements of connectivity? Brian alluded to Pomona having a high school. It's, you know, one of the few high schools that I know of where two separate campuses on in two separate localities and students actually being transported to and from, as well as um, the lack of connectivity of pathways and, and that. And, uh, and we've argued for some improvements and enhancements there since that high school's gone forward. Things change, things grow and things develop, so you have to be adaptable. One of the things of a placemaking program is that opportunity to be adaptable and to, uh, to start to look at now the towns are established and now the villages are established, how we uh, facilitate the needs of the growing communities in those areas for the future. And it's, uh, it's very much a challenge. I welcome this. This is something that I think is long over, overdue. I think that those elements of, of, um, of connectivity, of planning for each of those individual localities is something that each of them should be prioritised as fast as we can because I think that's something that's, that's been missing. And whilst the planning scheme tries to give that overall view down to the, the elements that individual communities desire within those localities and the things that make them unique and the things that make them livable and all the rest of it are the, are the things that we're trying to seek input into here and, and try to improve and enhance for those communities. A lot of um, decisions get made by council saying this is what we're giving to you without a lot of consultation. So actually having a process by which that consultation is undertaken to drive the direction of council for the future in each of these localities is, is something that I believe is needed and uh, we've long been uh, challenged in, in trying to achieve that. We do master plans for sporting complexes and for, for other areas and all the rest of it, but the townships and the villages themselves deserve that same sort of thought process and capacity put into it. Pomona is um, the first place that floods. Every time it rains, it's the mm -hmm. first place that floods. Um, my putting my disaster management hat on um, is something I'd like to see if we can, we can remedy and rectify. I'd like to see a flood study undertaken of the whole of catchment there. Yeah. We've rectified elements of, of Pomona's flooding. Can we do more? Yeah. You know, I'd argue the railway's part, part of that problem, yeah. but I mean, no, without, without the, the, the things in place, I mean, can we enhance those sort of uh, challenges for a community like Pomona going forward? I don't know, but I'd like to see us try. I'd like to see if that's something that's feasible and it's part of placemaking, and that's one of the reasons I do support Pomona being one of the first... Uh, uh, as the pilot program, the size, the scale. I think we alluded to it in the in the in the previous uh, debate. The size, the scale, and the elements that Council Stockwell alluded to, which are around Pomona, I think make it ideal for the Pomona, the, the the pilot program. And I do agree with staff that those elements are the reason that yes, uh, I would support Pomona as being one of the first localities. I think there's a lot going on. There's uh, uh, an annual um, uh, project by university students. There's been going for some years now to, to look at what, with a lot of input. So there's a lot of ideas being thrown around over the years with regard to Pomona. And uh, I said, it's not that any of our villages or townships have not had significant input, but it's usually been about one element or another, or one component or another, or one thing or another, not the whole. And so placemaking program for each of our villages for, to, to define it, and help uh, drive identity and, uh, and the future of these localities is something I support. Uh, I wish we could put them all on the table at once. I honestly wish we had the funds and the capacity and the resources to just go, bang, let's do all of these. But it'd be a logistical nightmare to try and try to put them all at once. So we do have to prioritise. So I said, I don't, I don't wish to play favourites. Uh, and it's difficult. When, when there are so many pressing needs uh, out there in the community being put forward uh, all the time. 
but the size and scale of Pomona and the and the, the elements of Pomona I think make it ideal to be the first for the place making uh, pilot. Um, I do agree that all the things that you said, Council working with regard to Kin Kin. Um, the only chance with Kin Kin is I don't know how we'd do um, a dozen pink stumps days around the uh, <laughs> uh, around the Shire <laughs> and take that to the rest of the community. But um, uh, and I do um, appreciate all of the, the elements of your impassioned plea there to, to, for, for Kin Kin. But I think once we get the process right, I think Kin Kin will benefit far more greatly from having um, a better understanding of how the, the placemaking pilot has been undertaken to facilitate Kin Kin for the future, to be the, the first cab off the rank when we actually have this down pat. Tom, question. So are we back to the original lotion now, or the staff recommendation? Or is this the, the this staff recommendation plus plus B. Plus, plus B? So this is the motion. Then we'll go back to the original staff no, recommendation. No, no, this, no, this, this is the motion. This is the motion. This is the motion. This is this is the motion. Is yeah. So the first motion, which is mine, was yeah. lost. Yeah. Look, we're going now. We move on to the second motion, which is uh, takes on board the staff recommendation with the addition of B. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thinking and not spoken. Because I, I, of course, I, I think I. I'll speak, to, I'll speak to it. I'll yes, yeah. um, Pomona, I, I believe, is uh, the best place, you know, after long considerations and, and so forth, that the staff have decided that. But I'm, I'm pretty against approving Kin Kin and Tawantan as, as the next. Um, yes, it, it says it here, but, you know, when we go back to what um, Councillor Wilkie was saying, that um, the next, Kin Kin scored a 58, um, North Shore and Como a 61, Koran Pinbaran 66, and then up to Tawantan. So, you know, what about Como and uh, Koran? Um, and I see that the, the place making of the, the hinterland more or less spreading that way and, and getting that under control because Tawantan, I, I would suspect, would, wouldn't really cross over. Or in some ways, would, but most of the ways, it wouldn't. It, it's a very different identity town than it is stretching from Kin Kin to Como. By the way, you know, Como should be get, getting a little bit higher ranking. It has its own postcode and uh, four five seven one and forty six people live in Como. So we, have, we should not be forgetting Como. Um, but no, it, I think all all that is really important. That to stretch out the uh, the place making there. I think it's um, too soon to nominate Tawantan as the next one the, the, after Kin Kin. And I don't even think Kinkin should be next. I think we should be, it may, may expand, it go in its own direction. So can I? If, if, I don't want to. I don't want to vote against Pomona, but I'm not in favor of B. How would I split those? Well, you could move an amendment which strikes out B. <laughs> can I ask a question? Okay. Through we'll just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Do you okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to make, make an amendment. Make an amendment that strikes out B. Okay. So that's basically the original motion. The original recommendation. Well, it's, yeah. just, it's as, it, as it is written, except strike out the pretty well close to the... Well, can't we just stand back to the staff, staff recommendation? recommendation? Well, okay, so I'll we've, show we've got a motion before us. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a council through the chair has asked to make an amendment. Um, the council should be allowed so to put that to the council through the chair. Yeah. Yeah. So it's amending the motion before us. Okay. Mm. And with the wording, minus B. Question, Question um, to Kim. Um, there is a proper place program selection process. Would anything change in 12 months' time? So my, uh, they've gone through stringent, robust criteria. Um, is there a likelihood that Kin Kin and Tawantan won't sit in the top three um, 12 months down the track? And will you have to, in 12 months, um, go through the process again? Or will you be relying on um, you know, the, the process you've just under, undergone? Mm -hmm. um, like I, I said just previously, um, we did deliberately didn't put a second mm -hmm. location up. Uh, we're recommending a pilot location to test the framework, to test the selection criteria, to test the process, to gather learnings, evaluation, and to bring that forward to council. 
um, we would reassess locations again in 12 months. Things change. Okay. We'll have determinations on locations. Communities change. Things happen in 12 months. So we would reassess locations at, at that point based on you know, the context and what's, and what's happening in, in the community. Um, we did discuss Kinkin and Tawantin because through the process, those three locations came to the top. You know, that we could only recommend one based on resourcing. Uh, that's why the report su suggests them. But um, there is potential for things to change. And I think the, pro the pilot program will give us a whole lot of insights yeah. and learnings. Yes. Can we have okay. a seconder for Councillor Wigginer's amendment, please, to test I'll it? Have this, okay. um, seconded by Councillor Lawrenson. Tom, you have the floor. Oh, I, I, I probably don't need that to speak anymore. Um, just, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't like to preempt now without robust discussion what's going to happen in the next stage of the place making. I'd just like to okay. focus on Pomona. Mm -hmm. Let's take our learnings from there. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll speak to the motion. Um, I, I, I am going to support the um, the change that Tom made. Um, I think that on the recommendation of the staff, um, who are the experts in this area and have been committed to this program for four years, um, I get it um, that we need to know what works, what doesn't work, and whether the there's going to be any changes um, to preferred locations. Uh, place program needs to be set up again for success um, and there may be variables or just different factors that come to play. Um, so I will support um, the amendment um, and it doesn't dismiss Kinkin and Tawantan as identified townships for the next two priorities. Um, it just doesn't set it in stone. Um, and I think that's just, um, I don't know, equitable. Just for oh. the sake of, I'll, I'll, I'll talk against it. Um, one of the reasons that I, I actually sought to approve them is that we are coming up to a budget process. And in the report, they talk about needing extra resources. I want a motion on the books to to justify why we are going to increase the uh, revenue to the placemaking program. And there's good reason for that. Um, the good reason is that we've done a lot of consultation recently, most recently with the corporate plan. And the issues that placemaking deals with are a very high priority for our community, but our, our budget allocation to them is not. If we can't commit to another two priorities now, it leaves it open to uh, going another whole year and putting it off. I want them to send a really clear signal um, that next year in budget, so the budget for two places, based on the current information, they will be Kinkin and Twain. I understand what Councillor Wigan was saying, that Cran could also put its hand up as being a, a, um, a, a worthy recipient, and I agree. Uh, one of my thoughts previously was Kinkin and Karen could be the one project that's probably got the scale together of a Twonton based project. Um, but to me it is important to give staff a clear direction that um, yes we do have to wait for the results of the, of the pilot but place making is not new. It's not going to change dramatically in 12 months. Some more issues might pop up in different locations um, but to me it's important that we do say, yep, we're going ahead with three to start with over the next year and a bit. Joe, question for staff. Mm. Currently in the budget, we have sufficient to commence the place making pilot program this financial year. Yes. So one of the budget considerations with the next budget would be how many more place making projects we'd like to complete in the following year. Um, does the size and scale of the of the town make a difference to the uh, the budget requirement, or is the process essentially? Process is essentially similar. Again, the pilot 
We'll answer a lot of those questions, <laughs> Councillor Jurisvic. Um, I guess I guess I asked my own question. Yes. <laughs> so it's testing a whole range of you know whether we've got the resourcing allocation right, whether we've got the budget allocation right. Um, it may vary. You know, once we refine the process, we might be able to go. There's major and minor. You know, a major location looks like this. A, a minor location, or different wording, whatever, but um, might be this. Um, those sorts of things are what we'll explore through the pilot program. So, from a budget perspective, do we need to know which towns are the next two priorities, or could we just do a blanket mm -hmm. two place-making projects and allocate a budget allowance for that? And then, yeah. then once the pilot is the complete, we could determine which the priorities would be. Yeah. So, just a, a question. So, the report on page twelve says that um, if this was to be maintained in future budgets, then the proposed future schedule be kin kin to wanton. Um, Is that accurate given what you've just said that there may be some change to the location um, and should that have been identified in the report? So I'm just sort of a little bit confused. Um, we've got a report stating, stating we've got two identified areas. Um, we don't want to put it in concrete, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling comfortable with the report as written, but what's been said over the table is there's possibly, and, and correct me, but there is a possibility that those two townships may not be identified as the next future priorities. Is that correct, Kim? Because it will change my position on this. Yeah, so I, I hear what you're saying and I can understand. Um, I'm what, confused. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. I, I guess what we were hearing from council, um, we workshop this with you on a number of occasions, is that there might be a decision to do more than one location. Yes. So if there was to be a decision to do more one, loca one location now, we would suggest Kinkin and Taunton would be the next locations, and the report says that. Um, if, you, if we were to start that now, we, we suggest doing a pilot location now, and then as we move through that, council may then decide one, two, three localities at once, once we've refi refined the process. Um, so it, it, the report was, you know, on the table to say if you were to consider other locations, because through the budget process, and you'll see that we've put up options, we've put options in there and costings for one location, two locations, you know, what that might look like, and that'll come to you in the next couple of months. Um, so it really does come down to resourcing. You know, if council decided they wanted to do a couple of, more of locations now, we could make that work. Um, they would, you know, but it would be subject to budget and, and, and resourcing. So the answer to the question is um, that Kin Kin and Tawantan, if we go with the amendment, um, may not necessarily be the next two choices. I think we would need to assess it at that time. I think that you know they they would still rate fairly highly, but the, the, it's hard to know what the pilot program will reveal mm. in terms of process priority. Yep. You know mm. what comes out of that. So mm. we'll, there'll also be a new council. Potentially, right. yeah. Um, so I think there's there might be a range of considerations. Um, okay. I take I'll be. <laughs> so th okay, those thank, factors are just. Thank you. Um, I'll make my final vote at the end, Delinda. Thank you. Joe and Karen, how long do you envisage the place making program pilot to take? Is it a month, three months, six months, a year? Yes. The reason I ask it, the reason yeah, I ask yeah. it, we, we, we've got the, the budget and we start now. Yep, yep. We, you know, as, soon, as soon as this is approved, you, the go-ahead's there, get, yep. get underway yep. and start getting out there with community consultation with, with whichever community we decide has the priority at this point in time. If we budget for two more and this process is still ongoing, 12 months from now, and it takes more than 12 months, um, uh, that budget will just sit there waiting for mm. that, that process to be complete. Mm. I'm hoping it doesn't take that sort of length of time, but... Um, so there are different phases to the program. You know, the first phase 
uh, of community engagement, identifying the local aspirations, issues, you know, that can take anywhere from about three to nine months. Mm. Then you've got a plan. You've got to draw up, draft yeah, up all those. That's right. So I, in the, my previous role, I administered a place program for 10 years. Yeah. And um, it's ongoing. If you, de if you develop a local area plan for a place, like any of our master plans, they have years in them to, to implement. But that's what will happen. There will be years in these to, to implement. Uh, the first part of the process we can do in various localities, you know, the sort of three to nine month sort of planning process, but then there's a local area plan that might have a 10 year implementation. I get the and implementation, I'm talking to get it to implementation. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, it's a, it's a three to nine month process at, at least, uh, depending on the issues and further research, you know. How much not, sleep. That's right. Um, but, you know, we, we also found that once you start in a location, you can't, it's not like you just go into a location, you start a process and then you leave and go to another. Because you, you've developed the governance approach, community connections, okay. you know, so it, they are, it, once you're in there, there's an ongoing process. Which means that somebody has to be facilitated to continue that process on through that while the next and the next and the next... And the next step. That's right. But that level of facilitation does change over time, Joe. So it starts out very high level of counselling facilitation and then it changes. You know, community leaders step into place. Sometimes there's a place based um, person that become, comes out of the community that takes it on. The capital so Works program is implemented. That's right. It de the level of facilitation does change as you go, as you move along. Karen, you had a question? Oh, yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just think this is challenging, um, referring back to how much sleep. When we think back to, you know, how much sleep is our kin kin community getting, um, you know, and the daily issues that they face. So I need a question through the chair. Um, how can we best support kin kin by a motion that actually secures and assures them that we have taken on board what they're saying and what you said today, Councillor Frank, um, that their voice is being heard and that we can assure them that um, we will keep it in the amendment that they will be identified as the next project. So my, if that's a question to the Chair, my answer would be that you would Support Councillor Stockwell's motion mm. and not support the amendment. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Off you go. No, no, off you go. Off you go. Look, I'm, I'm not going to support the amendment uh, for the following reasons. There was a lot of discussion around this table about how robust the staff's work has been, mm. how robust the criteria has been how long this work's been going on for since 2019, how long these communities have been waiting for an answer on some of these things, mm. to have identified Pomona, Kin Kin and Tawantan as the top three priorities. And we're about to go into, only a month or so away from going into budgeting considerations where we can ensure that this work is finally done according to the top three priorities that the staff have identified after a four year body of work. To say that we need more work and more reports before we can make a decision on where we go next, I think is duplication. I think it's, um, I personally think it's unnecessary. We have a clear body of work before us which identifies the top three priorities. And also, um, by supporting Councillor Stockwell's original motion, it gives these other communities some surety mm -hmm. that they will be next on the list. We agree all communities deserve placemaking, but we know within the budget constraints of a small, relatively small council, that's not possible and it'll have to be rolled out over a series of years. But we've got a very good suggested start before us, which is Pomona, then Kin Kin and Tawantan, which I'm going to honour by not supporting this motion and given that politics is offer a numbers game if a new council comes in and it's left open um, it could just 
then yeah. come down to a matter of where the councillor group at that time to feel the greatest numbers are, not the greatest need. Whereas we have a report before us that clearly identifies the top three priorities on the basis of need and a very rational, well thought out, and as councillors have said, robust criteria. And I think that's reflected in Councillor Stockwell's motion, yeah. so I won't be supporting the amendment. I'll speak to it. Likewise, uh, I won't be supporting the amendment. I think, um, yeah, through the report, King Ken for one have been identified, it, along with Bono, as three localities who could have been taken this pilot program. So that means they've got the, the elements to facilitate uh, and work with a place like them, because they, they would work with the pilot program. Kin Kin, for all the reasons that Councillor uh, Wilkie alluded to, uh, would be an ideal locality. And over the years, um, my dealings in Tawan, having been a, being a local resident, but also having spoken to the Tawan traders over many, many years, they have a lot of, lot of ideas in that, and they don't, uh, uh, a lot of those haven't uh, probably had the uh, the ear of council that, uh, that it could have over, the, over time. As well as, um, if you're looking at the next two options, you would have a smaller town in Kinki and a larger locality in Tawantin to challenge the elements of the place making pilot, to take them to the two next um, size, if you like, uh, of consideration with regards to place making. I think they're, I think they're ideally uh, um, chosen and ideally uh, identified uh, and for that reason I will hopefully supporting the amendment. I think they should be the next two priorities for the place making program so that we can facilitate that element in the budget going forward. Yeah, I won't support. I appreciate um, Councillor Wigner's um, sentiments um, but I too won't support this amendment. I think it's uh, for comfort in our community um, and for all the hard work that you have done over the four years, you know, similarly to what's been done with Pomona as the choice has also, you know, we've seen that Kinkin Kin and Tawantin are very worthy as well. Um, that acknowledges all this hard work um, and it also gives us direction should we wish to um, advocate for it in budget discussions and it gives us a pathway and it gives those communities a pathway and some comfort and acknowledgement. So I won't be supporting this. Councillor Finzel, you wish to speak? Uh, to the yes, amendment. sure. sure. Um, I'll speak to it. Um, I won't be supporting the amendment. Um, I think we need to look at, lock in um, future directions and given the amount of work that has already been done as stated in the report. Um, you know, empathy sits at the heart of my decision here today. I think that community out there needs some, you know, a surety um, while they're waiting for the court ruling to come down. What they're living with on a daily basis, I think, if you know, this decision to, you know, just offer them that security that we are listening, that we're prepared to commit to the budget to see this done. I think that is um, really important um, today, given you know the duress that they're. Um, some of the people out there are living under. Um, so I think um, it's really important that we um, secure a space for King King to be next in line. Okay. Councillor Wigan, you wish to close? Yeah. Mm. I've often said that, um, that a community needs to take control of their own destiny or else somebody else may, do, may take control of that destiny and not have the community's interest at heart. And so I totally am supportive of communities taking on their destiny, making decisions, making plans, and so forth. And of course, council is an aspect or an integral element of a community. So council, but council can also be seen as outside of an individual community and sort of a imposing nature as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm always in favor of fluidity in decision making when it comes to what is going to be the next place making um, center, where we're going to focus on next. And if it wasn't, you know, it was spelled out in the report, yes, Kinkin Kin and Tawantin are next, but it didn't, it didn't put that in the actual, in, in, the, in the, the decision. It was, it was said as a recommend, you know, a suggestion that that's, what we're, that's what we're looking, you know, this to make sense at this time. But I prefer a, uh, a more um, 
yeah, fluid. I don't, I don't like to impo impose uh, our, our, st our um, decision on staff. I'd like to get it from staff coming this way, and then we say yes or no, rather than us telling staff what to do in this case. Though, it, though it's staff, it's, it's a very nominal, balanced situation in this case. Mm. So, okay. I'll put the amendment. Those in favour? Councillor Wegener. Those against? Councillor Finzel, Stockwell, Jurisovic, Lawrence and Stewart and Wilkie. The amendment is lost. We go back to the original, sorry, not the original motion, but Councillor Stockwell's motion, to which Councillor Stockwell, Councillor Stewart, Councillor Lawrence and Councillor Jurisovic have spoken. So Councillor Finzel and Wegener, uh, you wish to speak to Councillor Stockwell's motion? Well, I will vote for this motion because solidarity amongst the consumers. Really <laughs> 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 Thanks, John. Solidarity. I love it. <laughs> Look, what, I like to ride that wave too. <laughs> John, where are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling the stoke, guys. <laughs> yeah. Look, we, uh, uh, Councillor Wigan and I have both tested our um, other motions and um, amendments, mm -hmm. and the, the tribe has spoken. So, oh my uh, <laughs> who's been for all the, very, all the good reasons, <laughs> this is survival. The, uh, <laughs> oh my God. the staff report said that it was quite marginal between Pomona and Kinkin, as the mm. pilot place uh, Councillor Stockwell outlined. It hosted very, very good reasons why the thriving community of Pomona is a worthy recipient of the pilot program. Um, Kinkin and Tawantan will have some certainty that they'll be next once the pilot program has been put through its, its paces and I'll be doing my utmost to ensure that the pilot program is a success. Um, Councillor Finzel, do you wish to speak to this? Um, yeah, look, motion? just to say, look, I support this um, for all the reasons that have been discussed around the table. You know, um, in terms of community finding their own resilience in their own way in relation to your comment, I think, you know, Kin Kin is finding their own way. They, you know, they're pretty um, vocal in what what they want and why they need. I just think this is a, just another way to, you know, show our empathy towards them, to show that we're listening and their voice matters. Um, I think that this is great. It's a collaborative approach. We've had all levels of, you know, community, local government, state government engagement. I think it's great moving forward for a great, um, you know, starting point and the assurity to the other two spaces and the broader shire that um, you know we are innovative we are looking forward to a bright and sustainable future and you know that means everyone has a voice around the table so i think it's great this is a great opportunity uh, here before us today to um, move forward and give confidence to our uh, residents and visitors alike to this region that we um, you know we're working hard to uh, serve our community and meet the um, aspirations of what they want to see moving forward. Thank you. Councillor Stockwell, you wish to close? Very quickly, I, I think Council Wigman's put a really good point up. If place making is successful, uh, it's one of the, it's that old Chinese uh, proverbs, you know, when you do leadership well, the people say they did it themselves. Mm. That's it. Good. Put the motion those in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Kim. We we got this. We got this.
It's the watershed. It's the divide between this catch with and the river. We're back. Yeah. All right, councillors, um, we're back to clear the meeting open again. We're up to item four, which is the financial performance report from Finance Services Manage, uh, Manager, the Acting Manager, Pauline Coles, and we have Acting Director of Corporate Services, Trent Graff, with us as well. Hello, Pauline. Hello. What's the news? Okay, good afternoon, councillors. I'll keep this relatively succinct and just go by exception of your questions. Uh, financial performance continues to be strong with operating revenues performing uh, above forecast with an operating expense. Interest income is $1.8 million above budget due to investment in sur surplus cash into high yield in term deposits, and that's likely to be closer to $2 million by the end of the year. Sales of goods and services continue to track above budget at $796,000. And operating grant revenue is also tracking above budget. Operating expenditure is 708,000 uh, under budget, with materials certain services $324,000 over budget, and that's prin principally relating to civil ops. This overspending materials and services has been offset by lower than budgeted employee costs of $1 million. However, that underspend will be impacted by the increase in the certified agreement, which has been now declared at 7.7% because ours is based on the December quarter CPI increase. Mm -hmm. So that will flow through in February, March. Did you say 7.7 .7 very quickly? Yeah, 7.7 .7 very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, capital revenue is above budget $11 million due largely to the plan of the QRA disaster funding. Uh, excluding QRA disaster projects, year to date we have expended 49% of our full year capital program, which equates to about $28 million with a further $10 million committed. Uh, council's current cash item at the end of January is $100 million with still $50 million invested in terms of Overall, we're still packing well to the end of the year. Any questions? Joe, then. I'll start. One for the CEO. The CEO training costs running under year-to-date budget. How are we going with our staff training and what are the opportunities going forward for the rest of the year to bring that up to speed or to uh, introduce, um, I don't know, uh, other trainees or trainee opportunities? Mm. Um, through the Chair, uh, Councillor Jurisovich, we've, we've moved a lot in relation to training um, here at Mesa and we're about to take our next step, which is the um, lead, Leading the Way program. I'm happy to say that um, that will be delivered. It's specifically aligned to our cultural values that we put in place with Noosa. Um, and we will have directors, managers, supervisors, coordinators undertaking that specific training over the coming months. In relation to field training, um, there's still more work that needs to be done as a council to ensure that we have our training matrix, particularly for our outside workforce, um, ensuring that tickets, etc., are, are all up to date. That's a piece of work that um, through people and culture and that organisational development and learning and development arm are now going through in conjunction with our operations manager um, at the depot. So we are moving, we're spending. Um, we'll have leadership training, so we'll be investing in our leaders. But I really want to be able to see those boots on the ground um, to be able to have that additional training work that, um, that they've been working for. And they're asking for it as well too. Um, so we do have, particularly parks and gardens, wanting to be able to ensure they have their competencies. Um, what we need to be better at as a council and what we're working towards is how we have our L&D or learning and development matrix set in place <coughs> so that works through over a period of time. But um, that work is underway and people and culture have undergone their own realignment, which is very helpful for us in that space as well too. Well, with the strain that was placed in during COVID periods, I'd like to see and ensure that people are getting the support and. Uh, and the training that uh, uh, that they need, our people are. The so other one I want to ask you about is the employee costs. You did under expenditure of permanent staff, salaries and wages. How are we going with securing our permanent staff? Mm. You'll, you'll note in the uh, next report that we have to council in that the last quarter, we've seen a reduction in staff turnover um, and that's gone from, um, and that's only for the second quarter, so you'll see a table there which will have year to date um, sitting at about 6%, so we've been able to manage that. But in that quarter that we've just had, we've gone from that 6% mark down to below 2% at 1.89. Uh, we're seeing the effects that COVID had of people making changes to their life and lifestyle decisions slow down. We're also seeing the economic conditions that are occurring in the community, that people who may have left the government sector 
to work in private sector roles, whether it be construction or consultancy or the like, are now returning back to government roles um, because, as we know, there is security in working within the local government or broader government environment. Um, so overall, we're seeing that settle. Um, we do have a number of jobs that we are struggling to fill, and that's not just representative of our council. It's local government. It then is across the board. If we talk to a number of sectors here in Noosa, they'll struggle to find roles. So we do have a specific issue here in Noosa in relation to cost of living. As a council, we're trying to address that through housing. But when we see around 50% of our workforce living outside of the Shire, um, we start to see that there's a number of factors that will affect our ability not only to retain employees, um, but attract as well. I'm more concerned with the people that are in temporary roles and casual roles that really need, need that, um, that permanency associated with those roles. Are we, are we working towards finalising those positions? Um, absolutely, through, through the Chair, um, Councillor Jurisovitz. Um, what we asked Council in October last year was to convert around 20 to 30 of our longer term casual employees or temporary employees. That gave us a headcount boost and we've been very mindful of managing our headcount. Um, but we're in a situation where our headcount is boosting but we're still being underspent in our employee benefits line cost. And that's just uh, basically a, a construct of the time that we're in right now and that attracting people to work to keep people within work, within our workforce, converting from casual to permanent employment is absolutely one of the best ways to be able to do that and achieve that. We've, we've got that. We're mindful, though, um, of the optics with the community of seeing that we're putting more and more staff on, um, but we have to um, look at what is some common ground and common sense. Long-term employees over 12 months delivering the same role, they should be made permanent. Um, there's provisions under the Industrial Relations Act we, to do that. I thought we made some provisions to, to implement that. As we have. How are we going with implementing? Very much, very well. Um, so, so that's all going through its process. Some elements, though, being in the government sector, we need to ensure that um, there is some competitiveness in any process we undertake or expressions of interest. There are some direct conversions. They've already been done because that made sense. Where there is a pool of some employees, we need to ensure that we follow the process. Um, so that's that's nearing its completion, and we've worked through that, leading it from the decision in October, through the back end of last year, and finalising it over the next few weeks. Councillor Stewart. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple of questions. Uh, the two points. So we're looking at five, the <coughs> enterprise bargaining agreements were linked to CPI. They're five percent. We're now at seven point seven percent. So we're looking at a two point seven percent increase. Um, what does that mean for the bottom line? It will mean about 600000 potentially a little bit more than that when it flows through annual leave and long service leave provisions as well. So it's going to take out quite a substantial amount of the current underspend. Okay. And with potentially uh, CPI forecasts to be lower in March 2023, that doesn't assist in any way, does it? Because it's no, no, our certified agreement is linked to yep. the December quarter provisions. Yep. So, okay. Yeah, okay. All right, just another question, page 20, uh, page 19, sorry. Um, materials and services, um, civil operations are over, year to date budget as are you know, a number of our areas, environment, sustainable development, community facilities. Is that just because of the cost of delivery logistics? Um, there's different reasons for some of them, so I can walk you through some yeah. if you want. So civil ops, if, because of the disaster work and yep. the Black Mountain situation, they've obviously spent quite a substantial yep. amount on gravel roads. Sure. There's some other underspends in the areas that are offsetting on that. Hollow parks, they're over because their revenue's over, so they have a linkage to commission Got from it. their revenue. Mm -hmm. So while it's showing is over, they've actually spent more revenue. Yep. Um, environment and sustainable development related to um, some consultancy in-house, which is now finished, so that shouldn't continue. Um, community facilities, again, that's similar. They're up in revenue as well. So um, <coughs> they will have an additional stream to chart relating to that. Um, is there any others particularly? No, to that makes sense. Yeah. If I'm if I'm if my restaurant's going well, I'm hiring more staff, so I've got more expenses. So it's equivalent to that, really. What you're saying. Got it. Thank if you. the pool is being utilised, we might have more casuals yeah. being put in to fill shifts. Okay. Um, a couple of questions. My first is in reference to the cash on hand, $100.3 million, of which $50 million is invested in higher yielding term deposits. Yeah. Um, the balance, I'm 
assuming and just seeking clarification, their funds held in trust and for restricted purposes. So those, so the remaining 50.3 million, mm -hmm. we can't look at term deposits. Oh, absolutely, we can. So that funds, we don't, we don't, we have a criteria that we need to put in terms of what we can invest into what different areas. Yep. Those surplus funds that aren't currently to invested in term deposits are sitting with QTC at a higher a rate than okay. what we have in our general operational account at Commonwealth Bank. So we have funds sitting in Commonwealth, we have funds sitting in okay. QTC, but we can pull those funds whenever we need to. So they're not, uh, I suppose, locked away for a particular period of time. So that could be three months up. or six month term deposit. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Through, through um, the Chair, just to also add to that, and you'll see the, the KPIs um, later in the report about our um, yield that we're getting with money in the bank in total. The return that QTC provides and offers us is comparable and competitive with the commercial banks. It's really down to obviously the offering between different institutions at the time, which is best for us to invest at, at that point in time. And, and presently, we're still getting the yield over that. Okay. Um, in terms of cash contributions from developers, um, I did some sort of digging around to sort of understand how all that works. Um, and my understanding, again, for clarification, that the de developer contributions are used to fund public infrastructure. And I looked online and had a look at infrastructure charges info on our website and in, in our infrastructure charges register. Um, my question is, have we ever done, um, I don't know, evaluated whether or not the developer contributions have in fact provided the required infrastructure. And I sort of tried to read that on the graph and found it really confusing um, and wondering, you know, the answer is possibly yes in those charts. Um, can we perhaps have a workshop or can that chart be, or what's on the website, be simplified? Or a legit, a legit column in the figures. I wonder who, <laughs> has that ever been asked all before councillors? Sorry, um, or can that be workshopped or just simplified? So, yeah. so back to my original question, have the developer contributions um, in fact provided the infrastructure that was required? Through, through the chair, I can probably answer that. But, and the first one is yes, we can hold a workshop with you. And we obviously involve our infrastructure charges specialists down in the development assessment branch. Fantastic. Um, we annually generate anywhere between one to two million dollars in infrastructure charges yep. revenue. Um, the charges are allocated to projects based on our LEGIP program of infrastructure, mm -hmm. trunk infrastructure works, which is also on our website. Yep. Um, what you will find is annually that our trunk infrastructure works commitments over its life are significantly higher yep. um, than what we can fund through infrastructure charges. Um, but in saying that, you, it's all important to remember that with our infrastructure charges, um, each new development or each new um, person or dwelling is only contributing to part of the demand load on that infrastructure. So they're not. So we have already have an existing population that would contribute to using the road. Um, the infrastructure charges are only only there to fund or capable of funding the upgrade component of the additional demand. So they always fund a part of the cost of an infrastructure upgrade, not the whole cost. So is it like a fixed rate? So that if, you know, the cost of the building or construction is X amount, it's a fixed 1%. And if it's residential or non, is it that simple or is it case by case? And should we be looking at streamlining it? We might have the Director of um, Environment and Sustainable Development help with that answer, Trent. I was going to say, give it, it, it actually is quite simple and the Director can, can kick in if, if she needs to and, and clarify. But um, our infrastructure charges are actually set, um, the state government um, through their um, charges framework set a cap okay. um, per GFA or per, per dwelling, per property, um, on the amount that we charge as infrastructure charges. So what you will find is generally across the state, most infrastructure charges, well, at the dwelling level at 28,000 as a cap, are relatively close to that mark. So okay. um, there is no relatively that we can charge more or, or we charge less, but but the recovery, whilst we have low recovery, we're capped at the maximum we can charge on that. Thank you very much. You've got the thumbs up. Thanks for the pass. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Any other questions, councillors? Yeah. Um, I'm just glad to see the Director of Finance can actually answer that question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the report. Um, given, like, a couple of things around risk around, um, well, labour I want to look at and the shortfall uh, with the employee 7.7 um, .7 increase, and I guess this is a question, I guess, through the CEO in terms of our realignment, when we're looking at staff training, which you mentioned, and you know competencies like parks and gardens, like you mentioned, um, how are we ensuring that the staff that we retain and or realign that their capabilities and their competencies, you know, that is that going to? What are we mitigating the risk of the cost to the organisation if those alignments aren't, um, you know, in the right position? Especially, we're already got that 7.7 increase. Okay. Okay. Through the chair, um, Councillor Finzel, I, I think the best response around that is in relation to how we develop our staff. So we we all have our professional development framework that we have in place. Um, we all have our performance framework that that we work through at different levels of the organisation. So I, I will work with directors and, and direct reports as to how they're going to be delivering um, their day-to-day -day role over a yearly basis, what their priorities are, um, what they need to be able to develop. That then goes down the line and then trickles all the way through the structure of the organisation. Um, the certified agreement is what it is. Um, the um, CPI, um, we as a council made a decision to not cap. Um, that's a decision that um, either came through a council process at the time or was dealt with operationally there was a decision that was made. Um, I think what um, any, anybody viewing or, or thinking about, well, look, this is a really big bump for council officers, yeah. we need to look back at the last few years when CPI was relatively um, zero. Um, yeah. So there hasn't been an increase that have gone through to these officers for quite some time. So there's a bit of catch up that's happening there. But it is a big bump. Um, we've demonstrated where we will be able to accommodate that over time. Um, and I know that our staff very much are, are looking forward to receiving that because they're feeling the pinch as well too, mm -hmm. like many others out there, particularly our frontline staff um, that are sitting at a level two, level three, doing the hard yards. Uh, they are the staff that absolutely need to be able to ensure that they're valued, remunerated, they have a great future with the council, they're valued and that we are training them through that value as well. Um, so in relation to attraction and retention and how we manage that, it is through all of our um, <coughs> professional development work that we do, our performance work that we undertake, um, and then, yes, there's um, the take-home pay, which is important for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Um, question. Uh, on page 25, risk and opportunities, um, and this will become a question. So one of the biggest risk I see to this council is underfunding critical infrastructure. So my question is, are we investing enough in infrastructure? And I don't mean only digital infrastructure, because I know we do a lot in cyber security. I'm talking physical infrastructure and maybe a question to Larry, who's sitting in the room. Um, or oh, Trent, excuse me, sorry Trent. Um, are we investing enough in, in infrastructure? Through the chair, I think one of the one of the, the, the quickest indicators, at least from a financial perspective, of whether we are over time investing enough in our infrastructure, it's one of our sustainability indicators, is what we call our asset sustainability or renewal ratio. So it's it's how much we're investing in our assets overall relative to how quickly they're declining or degrading in condition. Um, and so we present that financially. I think you'll see page on 23. page 23. Um, if we're if we're investing 100% of our depreciation in our assets, we're renewing them and keeping them in the current condition at the same rate at which they're degrading over time. Uh, this year, it's over nearly 190%. So we're we're investing twice as much. We're bringing the condition back up because we've got a robust roads and bridges renewal program with a lot of grant funding in there. So obviously that's just a quick desktop financial assessment as to what the QAO um, in Queensland Treasury used to assess our financial sustainability. But underpinning that is all the work that the infrastructure services team do with their asset management plans to ensure 
at an H asset class, the Low Capital Works program is robust enough to capture that. So I think we are always sort of going with all this is that um, a risk on page 25, substantial damage to or failure of council infrastructure due to natural disaster. Um, I think where, where I was thinking is that if we have ageing infrastructure, that in, increases the risk of damage and failure to natural infrastructure. And hence my question with, um, are we seriously investing enough in critical infrastructure? Hey, um, through the chair again, a good example would be currently with roads, we've got, uh, we've just finished taking another very detailed condition assessment of the roads. Excellent. So yeah. that then determines what we call our PCI, our asset con condition for our roads. And that ensures that over not just one year, but a five year term, that we aren't letting the, the, the condition of our roads degrade over that term. So that ensures we're investing enough in roads, for example. I'd say another good uh, aspect of that is our asset management plans, particularly around storm water. The fact that most of that is invisible, it's underground mm -hmm. and we don't know, uh, we, we can't visibly see the condition of it, but we've been undertaking the, the, uh, the appropriate asset management plan um, measures to um, detect you know, the, the condition of those assets underground and things like that. Correct, so. correct Councillor. So uh, stormwater is another one we are doing CCTV. I think we're at least 60%. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. Yeah. Cameras. The, the, the other area that's probably um, next focus for us is our buildings and structures. Um, the age of our existing we've been doing that we're seeing right now is a good example of that. Um, and work around the condition assessment um, and capital works program to bring our other smaller facilities such as halls, et cetera, up to stand is a critical one. Thank you, Trent, that was great. Councillor Wigner. I'd like to add to it, Councillor Lawrence, and on page 39, which is a head, we're skipping ahead, but it, the grants for cascading risks due to critical infrastructure failure project together with the Sunshine Coast is still pending. So that's something that We'll, we'll go about it in the next issue, but I think I think that's what you're getting yes. at. It's a cascading concept of like one thing falls over, and the next thing falls over, the next thing falls over. Yeah, and it could be monumental. Um, it's to me a serious risk future when we talk about emergent risk. Um, well, that's that the whole point me. of asset management plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone care to move the motion? Oh, move. Councillor Drusevic, seconded. Councillor Lawrence, Joe. Um, yeah, thank you again for. A very comprehensive financial report, seeing <coughs> a sound financial position uh, recently. Good to see that the uh, um, the measures of financial su sustainability continue to be on track or above uh, above their measures. Um, the capital expenditure record capital expenditure continues continues in this council. And whilst it seems below budget here, a lot of uh, uh, contributions are, uh, are being accounted for. A lot of work is, is being undertaken. Um, with uh, additional um, works there. It's good to see so many areas of council actually performing above budget with regard to uh, operational elements and uh, that we're managing uh, the other elements uh, appropriately. So thank you for all the time and effort you put in there and the level of um, comprehensive information that we get every month. Now, anybody else wish to speak to the motion? Put the motion. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you, Trent. Thank you, Pauline. Next item is the Operational Plan Progress Report. With the report from our Chief Executive Officer, Scott Waters. And Scott, um, this is a progress report up until December 31st, 2022. Correct. Yes. Thank okay. you, Councillor. Would you like to talk us through it, please? Chair, thank, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Um, councillors, um, you'll note that we have a report before us for the operational plan at the end of quarter two. As our chair said, as at end of 31 December, we know in the short period of time that we've had for this um, third quarter or this calendar year, the amount of work that we've worked through to date. Um, so you'll know you'll be looking at some of those metrics and going, we've already done that or we've moved past that. That'll be dealt with within the qu third quarter. Um, what I'd like to draw our attention to is probably what our major change has been around this in that um, we've had the move um, from the two to now we're looking at seven completed pieces of work. Um, we are fairly steady where we're sitting with our on track items and they are on track, um, they are getting done, they're being um, delivered um, and there's only one item um, that we have that, that's yet to be started and I can refer to that into the report. 
Um, but we're seeing the maintenance of the Bridging Beach Surf Club has been completed. Um, we've got the community support software upgrade. That's a very important piece of work that had to be done. Um, we had very specific software to deliver the financial um, requirements of the Australian government when we're delivering aged care and health services. Um, was basically running on what we would say would be an old um, black and green screen dumb terminal. Um, not exactly our, our issue, it's um, our friends of the Australian government that still had an older system. We've been able to upgrade that. There's been cost there, but that investment is absolutely um, very well, very well money spent for that particular part of the council business. Um, Noosa Parade, um, we're talking about reinvestment into our infrastructure. Noosa Parade, um, that has been delivered. Um, it's upgraded the stormwater. Um, we're working through some of the defects that we have over time, but ultimately um, that's a great piece of infrastructure that's been delivered. Um, remediation of the brickwork at the butter factory. Um, wood borer issues at Wallace House, that was pretty much well underway and um, we can say that's now being completed. Um, and on an overall basis, it's a, it's, a, it's a report to council that shows that there has been um, steady delivery um, through the year. We will see um, much more that will come through at the end of the third quarter. It's just the nature of how we work within our budget cycle. Um, our corporate plan, as we know, um, we're any moment about to go out for our community consultation. It's been held back a touch. Um, I had a bit of a goal and a very tight goal of getting that out by the end of the calendar year, uh, but I think it's important that we spent that time in January as not just council officers, but as a council, to go through each of the themes and get that right. Um, it's being designed up now, it's about to go out, and that is going to be a fantastic piece of work that this council can really hang its hat on. Um, the community spoke, you listened, and you delivered a great piece of work from there. Um, on an overall basis, as I spoke about within the last report, we've seen a, a slowdown within the turnover. Um, so mm -hmm. that's really important for us. If we look at our casuals and our temps, there's turnover there, but historically our council has looked at our FTE component. Mm -hmm. So we've ensured we've brought that back into line with what the previous um, and historical reports have been through to the council. And we're seeing that we're bringing that down quite a lot. Um, how are we doing that? Um, as we spoke about within the last item, it's ensuring that temps and casuals, that they have a permanent role, um, that we're creating the right signals to our workforce in relation to training and values. Mm. Why Noosa is a great place to work. Um, if there are um, staff members that are applying for roles outside of the okay. Shire, we're absolutely welcoming them to be able to come in and out. Um, sometimes in local government, you want, the, you want your staff to be within your Shire, and that's absolutely right. Here in Noosa, um, we need to problem solve. And if there's the ability to draw people from other parts, of South East Queensland workforce, that's exactly what we'll be doing to do that. Um, we do still though have quite a large number of roles that, that are yet to be filled. Um, what does that do? That, that puts pressure on staff, that puts pressure on timeframes and delivery. Um, I met with our people and culture team on Friday, worked through some of their structural changes, um, so they'll be working towards having um, their business partners set for each and every single director or directorate that we have. Um, they'll then be able to support organisational development, learning and development as well too, really clear functions, and then triaging the onboarding and offboarding of staff so we have a better idea as to how we're operating as a council as well. So I'm really happy with how that part of the business is operating. Um, our capital team, um, again, record spend within capital for this council. Um, the team are absolutely kicking goals. Um, the Director of Infrastructure and myself, um, we were, met with the Noosa Waters Association this morning in relation to Lock and Weir. They were really happy with the progress that we're making and the relationships that we're building as well. Um, so it is a report for you, Council, to be able to be um, happy with steady progress is what I would say. Um, we haven't gone leaping ahead and getting work done. It, it's steady as it goes. Um, I'm not seeing any red flags of non-delivery. Um, I'd like us to be a little bit more ahead, uh, but I am also cognizant of we had a really big year last year from floods. Um, we had to deliver a budget. We had a lot of extra work that we were delivering that is uh, extraordinary as, as opposed to what you would normally be doing, looking at structures and conversions of temps and uh, corporate planning. Um, all of that takes away a little bit. So I'm looking forward to the Q3 report before you and really happy to take questions. Um, the director cohort is here as well too, so anything specific within those departments and areas, 
they should be able to help and provide any advice for you from there. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Council. CEO. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just the staff turnover rate um, in the second quarter of 22-23 decreased from 6.21% to 1.89%. Yep. I mean, that's a phenomenal turnaround. Um, mm. Well done. You know, like, yeah, I know it's not a question, but you know, that, that's significant, um, considering especially, you know, we did have those high turnover rates last year. Okay. So really well done on that because it shows that people are, you know, happy, they're content and, you know, a, and a, a workforce that, you know, is stable is, is a strong one. So that, yeah, well done on that. That's terrific. Just a quick question. The 15 um, quarter one um, behind schedule, I just note they're the same 15 in quarter one and quarter two. Um, both are they the exactly the same projects? Pretty much, yeah. Mayor. Pretty much, and um, we've we've noted those as an executive. Um, a lot of them are Q three deliverables, and there's different reasons why. Whether it's the SEMP project waiting for specific yeah. weather conditions, um, there's, so there's <coughs> a number of elements that sit behind those. Yeah. Um, but um, they they will be getting onto track. Yeah. Um, and if not delivered, there's an opportunity there for some of those to move really quickly to <coughs> being delivered. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Last one is um, this report identifies whether or not there have been any matters dealt with in a confidential session which have at subsequently been made public. There was one in this quarter. What was that? Um, was that the um, mayor? I think it may have actually been the Noosa Waters Lock and Weir. <coughs> okay. There's another one today. How, how oh, that was in. Yeah, it's the December quarter. Can Mayor, can I maybe take that on notes? Yeah, sure. I, just wanted, yeah, yeah. I, I do remember we had a special meeting yeah. and that was closed for Nurse Waters Lock and Weir. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. let me see if there was another item. I yeah. can't tell you off the top of my head, but I'll take that on notice yeah. if I can. Yeah. Was it closed? Yeah. Yes, it was closed. Because I wasn't in that meeting because yeah, I had a comment. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. Amelia. Um, <coughs> Scott, uh, KPIs were first developed council at the beginning of 2014, 2015. Mm. Um, how often are the KPIs reviewed and when was the last time they were reviewed? Mm. Um, through the chair council, Lawrence, and you normally do that with your corporate planning. Um, mm. And um, the, the council will make a decision at, at any point in time as to what KPIs the council would like to introduce. Um, and there's a ways of which you would do that. Um, what we want to be able to achieve with our new corporate plan is that um, we have very specific <coughs> KPIs that are sitting underneath each of the themes and the deliverables. Um, so we've had our um, Director of Executive Services, Director of Environment and Sustainable Development, Director of Community, have all been working on that and have been able to put that together for um, what will go out for the final community consultation. Um, since the amalgamation, Noosa Council's remained very steady and stable with how it's been delivering to the community. We, we need to remember, I think, those first two years um, and then moving into the last term of council that was had. Um, it's very much picking up that early work that was delivered in 14-15 and they were being delivered forward. This term of council um, held off on our corporate plan, um, awaiting a new CEO. <laughs> final stage we're probably a little bit behind where we need to be on that but we know that we'll have that with a great new plan that's been very well uh, consulted with our community so this is the first time the kpis have been reviewed since 2014-15 is that what you've said that that'd be my understanding yes okay. yep. and with this within this corporate plan so well overdue and um yeah, yeah it'll be great fresh way forward. new council ab absolutely um i do have another question um, page 37, um, the more Modern Water Monitoring Program. It's on track with environmental services um, and very exciting and we discussed it I think in November round of meetings, a deployment of real-time water quality loggers is soon to occur. Um, I want to reference that um, meeting in November uh, last year and I, I moved a motion in regards to an integrated water quality um, in regards to the integrated water quality mon monitoring program I requested that we investigate the feasibility of developing a citizen science water quality monitoring program and I was hoping that that would feed into the program that's in front of us can I get an update with the citizen science um, program um, because I've had a lot of 
community, environmental community groups reach out who are very interested, including the Noosa Environment Education Hub, Noosa Surfriders, the Burgess Creek Project, just to name a few, um, who really would like to partake in the water monitoring pro citizenship, sorry, citizen science water quality monitoring program. Mm. Through the Chair, Councillor Lawrence, and I'll take that on notice, um, noting that you'd like an update on that particular matter, and I'll have the department provide that for you. That would be excellent, thank you. Um, and another question in regards to page 38, Burgess Creek Monitoring Project with um, University of Sunshine Coast. So um, that's exciting because I think I reached out to our environment group at the time with Dr. Javier Leon. Um, my understanding that he's just recently installed some equipment at Burgess Creek. Again, can I request an update on that? Through the chair, absolutely, Councillor Lawrenceton. And, um, and just noting, we, we followed process in relation to that engagement. So while um, um, myself, <coughs> Councillor Finzel um, sits on the um, I'll be understanding on board that, with, yeah. with UniSC. Mm -hmm. um, we made sure that that went back through University of Sunshine Coast, followed the MOU process, that then was able to engage that collaborative work that you see getting delivered. So uh, um, we'll get that update for you and, and know that we followed the process in relation to that. Thank you very much. Joe, you can Chris how I'm concerned. On page 31, I see the implementation of the waste strategy behind schedule. Not only is the implementation of the waste strategy behind schedule, the actual drafting and public consultation of the, uh, of the waste strategy is behind schedule. And if I read 1.4, if I can find it again, excuse me, go down here. Uh, develop a new waste strategy, we've had two workshops held. But a pause to public consultation along with corporate consultation rollout. Community consultation now planned for January to March 23. Draft expected by May 23 for adoption in June 23. If we don't adopt it till June 23, how are we going to get all the recommendations of it into the budget discussion so that we know what we're going to need financially in our budget discussions for implementation? We haven't got it to the implementation stage because we haven't finished the, uh, the planning of it at, at this point in time. How are we going to make sure that we've got all of those things that aren't going to be adopted until June 23 into a budget process that starts well before then? Mm. Um, through the Chair, Councillor Jurisovic, there'll be a number of actions that we need to undertake already that are known that as Council officers we would recommend to the Council that you undertake as part of the budget process. While we're looking at adoption in June, we should be well aware of what the key priorities are in relation to our waste strategy at that point in time. Um, it has been a theme um, in uh, the one-on-one -on -one meetings that myself and um, our corporate service team have had with Council around waste and how we can do that better. Um, so yes, it's unfortunate there's been slippage in that particular strategy. Um, I don't think all is lost though. Uh, I think we have the ability um, to be able to look at the work that's been done today to understand the priorities and, and there are numerous priorities in relation to waste. What Council sees is the highest level of importance. Uh, we know that for future budgets, this will inform that, um, but um, the issue that we face is around our community engagement, how we're engaging with our community at certain times. We wanna make sure that when we're engaging that we're able to not have too many large pieces of work go at once and uh, we're a bit of a a victim of our own success by way of doing a lot of really big pieces of work right now all at once and we're trying to get a pipeline of what we deliver. We had to put waste back, otherwise we would have confused the message with the corporate plan. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying. The concern, the concern, with, the concern with waste though is that um, we've got a zero emissions target. Yes. We've got all these other elements that we get to as well, Mr. CEO. So how are we going to ensure that we get, you know, keep that keep that time frame of all of those other targets that are associated with this on time, on yeah. target? Um, through the chair, Question Councillor Jurisovic. Yeah, um, we we have our priority list already, Councillor um, yeah, what we need to what we need to do is focus on what the priorities are. Um, while the adopted strategy with council, a good example is our corporate plan. We as a council already know what our priorities are. We've worked at it over a length of time. We need to do implement elements tomorrow. We would be able to do that um, ahead of the adoption, ahead of the schedule. 
but we know the priorities. Um, we've been working on them for a long time. I, I think through our budget process, we very much need to be able to highlight those and whether it's a specific um, workshop on waste, um, that would be time well invested. Work through the strategy work and where we're at today, highlight the priorities, council, um, what would you like to see within the funding that we have available to deliver against those priorities? More concerned to be the, the timing of the community consultation which we go to the community and just, you know, the community's input mm. as to how that how that drives forward and what those priorities come for out of that community consultation. Yeah, I'm taking taking on board council to research. Tom, do we still have um, um, Michael Ritchie MR consulting on the case with that? That's my understanding. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's all down to timing and budgets for Tom that I'm concerned about. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to raise also, and I guess it's along the same lines behind schedule, the review of the Noosa Local Disaster Management Plan. Um, just a bit of a feedback as to where we're at with that. Um, given that it's great that we've got, like, we're retaining our staff, but I am always concerned too about our organisational capability and, um, you know, the readjustment to the organisational you know, cultural planning we're heading along with. Um, I just want to be reassured that, you know, the staff are okay moving forward and um, just a bit of a feedback mm. where we're at with the uh, disaster management, given that also impacts heavily on community yeah. with their resilience to be able to manage a disaster. Mm. Um, I, I might answer part of that and then I might defer to our Director of Infrastructure, Larry, who has responsibility for disaster management. Yeah. Um, you'll see within the next report where uh, we have had um, a function within our structure being um, community recovery um, within the community team around disasters or disaster recovery. We're now formalising that as a function within our structure. Um, we have somebody that's working within that role, mm -hmm. but we're now formalising that. Um, we have our disaster management functions that are sitting within infrastructure um, and we have a team that sit around that. Um, we as a council over time though, um, and depending how um, we have the effects of future weather events, whether mm -hmm. we need to have a more permanent workforce, um, mm -hmm. and the issues that we are facing is that when a disaster hits, um, we're all pulled from our day jobs yeah. to be able to go and not only the deliver um, what is the immediate response, but then also the recovery. Mm -hmm. And we know recovery can take yeah. years to mm -hmm. get that done. Um, so a decision we need to make in the future around that, but um, I'm very confident, Councillor Finzel, that um, we have a great team that um, is sitting within infrastructure to be able to deliver the immediate response, the preparation of the here and now. Um, we saw fire tech kick in last week um, yeah. with the Ural Ringtail Forest. Oh, it was great to be able to see that. We um, mm. also had somebody that alerted us nearly more quickly than Biotech. Who was that? Uh, but, uh, oh, the mole man, <laughs> boy, boy, yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but we, as, a, as an immediate response, I'm, I'm really happy. And, and for me, you know, 12 months into the role now at the end of this month, yeah. Um, I walked in on those floods yeah. and yeah. The, yeah. the response, uh, and I've been involved in a few responses of, you know, actual floods of the Fitzroy River and shutting down airports, direct hits mm. of um, uh, cyclones, um, a, a lot. Our response was great. Fantastic. You, know, yeah. you didn't need to see uh, hanging around telling people what to do because they knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, so I'm confident where we are, but through the chair, I might hand to Larry just to give a bit of an update. Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's just a process that's been going. Yes. It's an external, external group that's been putting the local disaster management plan together. I think it actually goes to our... Yeah. Our um, WMG this Friday, group, yeah. this Friday, yeah. Yeah. so it's it's been done. It's just it's yeah. just. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have said it was behind schedule, but, 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 but I guess yeah. the timing of work. This is as of December 30th, yes. that's correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 so we're, we're, we're comfortable with this. Yeah. 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 That's that's it's coming to the first, it's coming to the next meeting, so I would have thought yeah. it was pretty much on schedule rather than yeah. 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 And councillors, this will be one of those those items that we're seeing that's sitting that behind schedule, Q3, that'll be done. Mm. So some of these will move really quickly yeah. for you in quarter mm. three. I guess the only reason it's behind schedule because it hasn't been adopted yet. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Someone wish to move it just a, a question through the yeah, chair. Of course. Um, the Noosa Heads Main Beach SEMP. Uh, it's on track, um, but it was behind track, and maybe that was a blessing in disguise given the current swell and tide, <laughs> high tide conditions and impending yeah, cyclone. Um, 
like it's a blessing, that serious blessing in disguise. But that brings me to my question. Um, it's a million dollars, I think, from memory, the, the Sand Nourishing Program. Mm -hmm. um, is it worthy to have further discussion on, I don't know, the whether it's worthwhile um, uh, and, and whether there are better solutions? Um, you know, we could have six months ago done the sand pumping and today we would have been probably in the same spot that we were six months ago. So, so my question is, should we be revisiting the merits um, and the timing uh, of, the, of the program? Look, I think that's a good point. The fact that there's a amount of sand there is now at the moment, the way the river's shifted, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, unfortunately, that, if you're forgiving over the last two years, it's shifted Every three 12, or four times now. It has, period. yeah. Um, so I think we need to look at it and understand what it is that's causing it, but, you know, it's, it's still, the SEM program is really to protect that, that section, yes, of, woods, section yeah. of, um, of land mass. So we need to understand whether that current sand build-up is going to stay or whether that's just a temporary thing. So we'll, we'll do some work on it before we go and hold us by spend a lot of money, absolutely. But that would be great. Yeah. The likelihood is that you know, once, once you interfere with the natural process, yeah. you're going to constantly have to yeah. so it's a constant man made change. process into the natural process to, to facilitate it because it's yeah. no longer a natural process. No. Someone care to move the oh, motion? Thank you, Councillor Finzel, seconded Councillor Lawrence. Yeah. Um, yes, after. No, second. Oh, sorry, yeah. Councillor Stewart. Oh. Um, Councillor Finzel, you're first. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, it's good to clarify some of those issues today about projects that are running behind, but you know, I'm confident moving forward that you've you know, got a good handle on what's happening. Um, yeah, my concern moving forward is just really making sure that the capabilities of our staff, they're not on overload. Um, I guess that can be addressed through, you know, addressing your staff training that we've talked about earlier, um, looking at making sure that, you know, they're getting the right pay for the right positions that will help alleviate external pressures in their own personal lives. Um, and uh, just thank you to all the staff for uh, the continued work that they're delivering under, you know, a big double capital works program and all the other um, big works that we're delivering across the Shire. As usual, I think these council is, uh, you know, we shoot beyond our reach, but everyone is, is up for the challenge. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll speak to it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think yeah, the operational. Sorry, Tom. Were you? No, you. Um, yeah, the, the operational plan progress report just shows um, again the depth and um, breadth of, of all the work the organisation is doing. Um, I think, I mean, my big takeout was that um, the decrease in staff turnover, which I think is fantastic. So well done, Scott, and and all the executive team. I think those values that you're putting in place have, are really, you know, showing um, that they're working and the staff are taking them on board and. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Um, there is a huge amount of work, so I, I too want to thank all the staff. Mm. Larry, largest ever capital works program, plus major disaster funding and, and major land slip to be fixed. Mm. Um, Kim and all her team, Trent. So coming into budget discussions, we've got some big decisions, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, thank you, Scott, for your leadership. And mm. um, yeah, it has nearly been 12 months. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, but it, it, you know, as I said, this is, is showing, it, there are some things that we're behind schedule on, um, but you know, the explanations for them are, are sensible and um, we all take them on board and appreciate and understand the constraints and concerns mm -hmm. around them. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's looking, shaping up to be another big year. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, staff. Yeah, you've talked oh. just about every weather condition with you. Yeah. <laughs> next month, next yeah. month, next yeah. month's on, baby. Councillor Wigner has a little march. Okay. I'm just going to speak um, in general across a, a lot of the, the topics here, just to be, to be brief. But, um, you know, we, we have talked that this is going to be a tougher budget coming up than that we're mm. looking like. The budgets are going to get tougher. And so what I look at is, are there any overlaps that, that jump out at me? And you might not be too surprised that I see the, um, the, the um, destination management plan having a massive overlap with, the, with all the different um, walking and cycling strategy, the parking park strategy, all the, all the different strategies below there, although on 4.1, 4.2, all the way down. And so if there's ever going to be a place where we might see an overlap that make it, we may um, have budget implications 
maybe we should look at that because we have placemaking, which is, which is an expense coming up. We have uh, the astronomical waste program, which is extremely important. We have new, st new staff in the organization, no realignment. And so I've just, that, I just have to point it out. It's not the first time I've been point, pointed this out that um, I'm waiting for my expectations to be exceeded and uh, haven't quite realized <laughs> those yet. So that's just, just my, my thought concerning this. Congratulations, it's a fantastic job. And uh, my God, you do a lot, Larry. You know, you've got so much done. <laughs> but that's just my little two cents that I want to throw in. Thank you, Tom. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Karen, you wish to close? No, I, don't, I think everything's been said. I'll put the motion those in favour. That's carried unanimously. Thank the you. next item is the operational plan. Organisational realignment. No, realignment. Realign realign Organisational <laughs> realignment. Noosa Council. Oh. Again, Scott. Chair, thank you. Talk us through it, please. Thank you. Thank you. And um, councillors, thank you. This is the culmination of probably nearly a year's worth of work. Um, you asked me to come into the council and have a look at how we were operating and what we were delivering. And uh, I very quickly moved to be able to do that. Uh, I had looked at what could be some potential quite, quite large changes within our organisation. Um, making those types of changes right now is not the right time for Noosa. Um, we we're coming through what is a flood. Um, we needed to get our corporate plan in place. And we really, um, for me coming in as well, needed to get a, a better understanding as to not only how our council operates, but how it has operated and how it has a very unique intersect with our community um, and numerous elements of our community. Um, 17 villages, um, you know, coming from a CBD and suburbs to 17 villages is a change. I, I think um, Phil Moran even noted that before I arrived, going it's a big change, but it's been a great change. Um, and um, each of our townships or villages are amazing. They have their history. Noosa has a long history that you've got to understand it before you start getting in and tinkering with it. Um, for me, I could come in and say, Here, here's an agile structure and it'll give you this outcome. I don't know that would work for Noosa. Um, what we did um, as an executive team, um, we, we pulled back in about March. Um, I put to council my views in around about May. I've been in the role for three months or so. Council, here's, here's what I think that we can focus on. Um, we got through our biggest budget that we've ever delivered. Um, that was a huge amount of work mm -hmm. for us. And we all took a deep breath in July. Um, mm -hmm. And then we started to come back and saying, right, it's, it's time for not just um, ourselves and the exec, but as an organisation to start to work towards what we can deliver in relation to change. Um, what do we want to achieve with change here at Noosa Council? Um, what we wanted to be able to achieve was, was better service delivery. Um, I've got a great team, um, nearly 500 staff, and if I add the other contractors, we're pushing nearly 700 people mm. that we're either directly or indirectly employing here. Um, and they're all doing a great job. They're all working really hard. Um, but we want to improve our service delivery. Um, and there was ways that our structure was operating that was hamstringing service delivery. Um, we wanted to improve our internal communications. Um, we wanted to be able to communicate better as a team. We saw our structure um, being really flat, really lean. Um, while that's got its benefits, it's also got its disadvantages as well too. Um, and we, I've heard quite a bit, and even in my early days, about siloing within the business. Mm. Um, that um, look to departments working in their own stream and not working together. Um, so we as an executive, we wanted to be able to address that. Um, we wanted to address the temps and casuals. Um, that was an absolute burning platform for us. And it was um, for a range of reasons. Um, um, temp staff that are sitting at a, um, just below a manager level that have been extended upon extended upon extended. Um, them wanting some certainty within their roles and then casual staff they've been with us a long time and some are actually happy to be casual because they like what casual workforce mm. provides for them um, and others going i need to apply for a car loan i need a house loan i can't mm. get it with a casual job um, so each of the directors worked through their departments and we saw the report that came to the council in october on the back of that um, we as an executive team um, sat down um, and we've said Let's have a look at three contemporary local government structures that are sitting out there within local government world at the moment. Um, and let's see how they can fit for us. 
Um, we got that independently um, um, mediated, or not mediated as such, but we had it facilitated in a way um, that would have each member of the directorship have their voice heard and what they wanted to be able to see. We worked through each of the structures, um, and, and like Noosa, different by nature, none of them really had fit us, um, so we came up with our own structure. Um, we worked through that as a team, um, pros and cons, and we started to get to what you now have today as your decision point. Uh, we then put to our staff in um, November, early December, after working with the management cohort as well, um, what we believe would be functions realigned within our structure that makes sense. Some additions as well too, so we talk about community recovery now sitting mm. within community, really highlighting some areas. Yeah. Um, the team within community, um, you'll see that there's name changes to their functions. They worked on that themselves independently. Um, so there was a process that we were following. Um, we consulted our staff leading into the Christmas break. Um, some areas needed some extra time, so we gave that to them in January, and the CEO also got COVID, so it was out of commission for two weeks. Um, so we were hoping to have this to you for, uh, for January and really hit the ground running. Uh, but it gave us a little bit of extra time to be able to talk within our staff base and get to where we are now. Um, we presented to council within a workshop. Um, and if, um, if I can through the chair, I'd like to talk through the functions and changes mm -hmm. that we have, mm -hmm. highlight in the report. I'll then talk to costs, three new roles that we're looking to implement in relation to that cost. And then councillors, I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have, but I might just talk through those changes first and talk through the three new roles and costs if I can. So Council, the, the structure that I'm asking for adoption from you today, as I've said, it's been extensively worked through. Our unions were engaged for our through our um, consultative forum. Um, they were also given details of what this would mean. Our staff have been given frequently asked questions as well too, as part of that consultation. Um, within the structure, we would like to recognise our Mayor and Councillors and that um, they are sitting at the top of the tree and that then flows through to the Chief Executive Officer. Um, our executive services department that we currently have, um, what we'll do is amalgamate that with what the current Office of the CEO functions are. It just makes sense um, and it allows us to be able to spend time on some areas that do need some time to be spent on at the moment. I also have the ability as a CEO to be able to have direct line of sight into people and culture, direct line of sight into governance, direct line of sight into media as well. And they'll continue to become really important parts of what we do more so as we get to the end of this year and the election. Um, I'm proposing that we put in place um, a, an executive coordinator um, to be able to not only support me with what will be a larger amount of direct reports, um, but also to provide direct support to the council. Um, there's time to time that we will get a lot of um, similar requests come through, coming to different areas. And if we can triage that at a certain point, we think we're going to be able to deal with them more quickly and provide better service back to you as a council when we have a single point in and a single point out. This doesn't take away though from your ability to be able to work with our managers and our directors to ask questions and to be able to understand um, a little bit further about what we're delivering and any other questions that you might have. So just know we, we don't want to take that interaction away, but when we get lots of different emails coming through, um, we can have a single point. We can understand more quickly though if there is a single major issue that's going on. Um, at the moment we're seeing lots of dispersal and so we've got no real visibility to see a lot of the issues that are occurring. So we're hoping to be able to have that. That will help me also with managing the amount of direct reports. Um, I'll have my director direct reports, departmental direct reports and then also mayor and councillors. I'll be working very closely with you. People and culture, workplace health and safety and payroll, um, they are to um, be part of what will be called the Office of Mayor, um, Councillors and CEO. So there, there's a change that we had there. We, we really want to be able to highlight that, that this is Mayor and Councillors and CEO together, some really key components for us there. People and culture, workplace health and safety and payroll. Um, workplace health and safety, um, I have a particular heightened view on as, as a CEO. Um, we've done a great job with our audit um, that was recently um, undertaken. Um, so I take my hat off to the team that have delivered that. They've done a great job. Uh, but I also, I have ultimate responsibility for all of our staff and um, I want to understand exactly what's happening when it's happening. 
uh, media marketing, communications and community engagement, which was recently added as part of this, this year's budget. Um, working very closely with Ken. Um, Mayor and I had first of our meetings this morning. We've been scheduling them in. But at a moment's notice, media now has an understanding of all of the hot buttons that are happening, uh, not only around the Shire, but within the business. Um, and they can plan ahead to be able to manage those for us, taking away um, some of the reactionary that we can have from time to time. Um, we'll be converting the, um, the director role of executive services to the executive officer of internal audit and corporate performance. Um, our internal audit, um, and the external members of that committee, they met with council last year, they spoke about areas that they would like to have focus on. I need to put some resources into that to make that happen. Um, and also in relation to corporate performance, we have a brand new corporate plan. We're wanting to be able to digitise how we're delivering our performance to the community by having a, um, a, a specific task in relation to corporate performance gives us a, um, a far better way of being able to measure that, implement a new system and to be able to take our corporate plan forward for the future. Um, governance um, stays as governance and that stays within that area. Reporting direct through to me um, and the, the triple C OIA matters, all of the different things that happen from time to time that are within my role and my remit to deal with. I'll then take you to the Director of Corporate Services and the, um, the Director of, of Corporate. Um, stays the same with finance, procurement, revenue, ICT and fleet. Commercial business services, this is the splitting of property. Um, this is giving one of our staff members that have a fantastic skill set the ability to be able to not only grow our current businesses that we have as a council, but our strategic properties. And there is, a, um, uh, there is an action out of our audit committee to be able to undertake a strategic property review. Um, we'll be ensuring that that gets delivered as a result of this structural change. Business process improvement, that is a role that is already sitting within our structure and that hasn't been filled. Um, but a good BPI practitioner will be able to get in and to be able to process map and process engineer how we do things within our council. When um, a, 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 a click and fix comes through or snaps and solve comes through and all of a sudden it says completed when we know yeah. that there's some issues, like, okay, let's sit down and work through that process and, yeah. and get somebody to process engineer and look at the other outcomes that we can have. Community services, as you'll see, um, there's some naming convention changes within community services and that's very much been um, brought on by the community team. They want to have some more contemporary namings. Um, as an executive, we support that. Customer service will come across from executive services and will be renamed to customer experience. What we want to achieve with that over time is looking at our libraries and different facilities that we have that are under the remit of the, the community team, becoming shop fronts for council as well too. So you don't need to come to the Twanton Admin building to be able to pay whatever you need to pay. Can we have that happen at the Croy Library? Can we have that happen at other areas that we have within our local government area? Bridgian Digital Hub, and all of a sudden, we're providing that extra level of service for our community overall. A disaster recovery, I'd spoken about that a little bit. You'll see that that's now highlighted sitting within community. And it's, it's, it's always there. sat within community, it's not a change. Always there, we're just highlighting it now. And the director was very clear with me saying, we need to highlight this. Mm. This is now a specific function that we need to, we need to talk about, we need to have in place. Um, we then have the split um, of the current um, environment and strategic development department. Um, to a regulation and compliance department and a strategy and environment department. I'll talk to regulation and compliance and I'll leave strategy and environment to last if that's okay, Council. Um, we will be looking at um, recruiting to a new role, being the Director of Regulation and Compliance. Um, we must note though that we have had a consultant in for the last 18, 19 months that has been helping with the load of the current environment and sustainable development department. Um, while the numbers aren't great, the direct reports are large within the current department and the type of work that be, is being delivered is extremely intensive. It's intensive with community um, you know, engagement and collaboration, um, but it's extremely technical when we're looking at the type of amendments we have with our planning scheme, when we look at the planning applications that we have and how we want to ensure that they absolutely adhere to our planning scheme, it takes time and it's too much for a single director to be able to deliver. By having that split, and we've seen that work over the last 18 months, we want to be able to formalise that. So we're going to the market um, if we get a favourable resolution of the council for a new director of regulation and compliance. 
development assessment, building and plumbing will be part and parcel of that. We'll be looking for a person that has um, local government planning skills, so that they need to be a qualified planner, but they've been around the local government sector for a while and they can take on some of these other elements that we're putting into this structure, and that's being environmental health um, that's been sitting in community that will be moving across. It makes more sense to sit there closely with local laws as well too. Um, and then our property team, which when we take out um, the triage of major events and we take out the business element, a lot of it is land use property permitting. Um, the, mm. the, it is more of a regulatory role. Um, so we keep that where regulation and compliance sits. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, we're looking at putting that together. We understand though that, and as an exec we've spoken about this, that this is, this is not the best department to be part of because you're always either regulating someone or telling them that they can't do something. So we're really clear as to how we can provide the, the very best in um, training for that particular department, how we can have a focus on how we can help that department. But um, it can be difficult when you're always dealing with difficult situations. We know that department will have to deal with it, but um, where there is an executive to be able to support them. Infrastructure remains unchanged. As you see, um, Larry's got a, a huge remit there, um, the highest number of staff sitting within that structure as well. We're adding waste. Um, it makes sense to add waste into there for this point in time. Mm -hmm. What our spend will be over the next three or so years is going to be a lot of infrastructure, um, particularly with our landfill. Let's get that where we've got the technical and design team, where we have the engineers available to be able to help get this infrastructure on the ground. In the future, moving it into environment or innovation might be the way to go, but right now, waste needs to sit purely within infrastructure to get the work done. Um, and, and deliver what's going to be a, a facility that's sitting at a higher level. In splitting um, the environment and sustainable development departments, um, that brings us to strategy and environment, which will ultimately be um, nearly a, a new department and a new mindset for us here in Noosa, um, in that we're elevating all of those external um, or functions of the council into an area that will be sitting above the structure. Um, it starts to create what is an agile um, organisation, whereas those teams have the ability to go into different areas. So whether it's the environment team, whether it's economic, and economic development, whether it's um, strategic planning or climate change, um, they can positively affect the business from being above the business and not in it. Um, those functions right now are sitting within different departments that then that it's not that they're not well recognised, it's just that they're part of the machine. We've taken them up and out of the machine and we're allowing them to be able to have influence through across the business. And um, that's the start of it being able to get an agile organisation where you get multi-school teams working together. We're not there yet. Um, these are some of the first steps. So economic development, major events and destination management, um, we'll be putting that together. Major events will be a triage point. We'll be working with the economic development team and where we have those external events um, that are um, coming to our council and wanting to deliver a, a major event with our community, we'll have them triage at that level of the council first and then we can provide them the most appropriate path. Um, so that's the plan to be able to deliver that. That top's just dropped off. I'll be able to tell off the top of my head. Um, we then have... Yeah, it's not, it's not, uh, we not then have a, you, Frank. We then have a... Um, and what I'm asking for is a new manager role to be able to have strategic planning um, and climate change put together. Um, currently we have the director um, not looking at any other parts of the business, but just strategic planning, having six direct reports of strategic planning. Um, that needs a manager in its own right. Um, how do we create value though for a manager role? Um, mm -hmm. Let's have our strategic planning and climate change put together. By putting those two functions together, we're, not, we're looking at what will be the biggest changes that we will have come before us in the next 15, 20, 50 years. Um, climate change will affect us for the future. Having the strat planning team side by side with climate change all of a sudden gives us a very strong future focused direction, not within the structure, above the structure that can then come down and advise what we need to do as a council. Um, so we've wanted to be able to achieve that. And our environment team, um, different by nature and new, so we know how important environment is. We wanted to elevate that in the business as well too, so that we can have the staff within our environment teams be able to provide advice to the business as well too. 
Um, we would have our current director, Kim Rowlings, head up the Director of Strategy and Environment Department, reporting direct through to me. Providing strategic advice throughout the council business is what we want to be able to achieve with those particular functions. So councillors, we're asking for three new roles. Um, the Director of Compliance and Regulation role, um, understanding though that that is already um, not exactly budgeted for, it's been part of our consultancy budget that we've had, but there's been a bottom line cost to that of around about $270,000 per annum. We then have our Manager of Strategic Planning and Climate Change that we're asking to add, um, and then a coordinator of the Office of the Mayor, Councillors and Chief Executive Officer. I'm going to put this forward on a two-year basis. I understand that this role has actually sat within the structure previously, working closely with the CEO. Um, and what we really want to be able to focus on for this role is that coordination assistance, but then also uh, with ECQ and the coordination they will need leading into the election, um, managing and working with candidates. Um, there'll, be a, there'll be a time requirement for me as the CEO. How mm -hmm. can we have somebody to be able to assist with that? And then we have the onboarding of the next term of council. Um, so we're, we're looking at a two year basis. We may be able to deliver it via an internal secondment, which will cut, to cut down costs, um, or we would look at a temporary contract around that there as well too. Um, if we look at that as just those three roles, um, it's approximately half a million dollars. Um, and uh, if we then, so that's on a, a gross cost basis, um, bottom line hit. If we look at it on a net basis, given that we've already <coughs> had a director for the Thank last you. 19 months, um, that's $270,000 per annum. That takes us back to the cost of the two roles at about $230,000 overall. Um, I'm asking that the realignment within the report um, be, be adopted as the organisational structure um, and there may be one or two administrative changes with naming conventions that um, I'd be asking you to give me the authority to be able to make those changes on an as-needs basis. Um, Council, thank you. I'm very happy to be able to take any questions that you might have. John. As an example of, of the new structure, yes. you know, waste has been you know, a, a big issue with us for a long time. And I look at the new structure and how it would be much easier to deal with it, with it, with taking waste and putting it with Larry, but also with the new structure of a future, you know, you're looking into the future. And how, how would you see waste being treated differently now than it was two years ago, a year ago? Uh, look, um, we'll have an infrastructure lens that sits over the top. But what we need to be able to do is have our innovation team in the digital hub mm -hmm. um, start to be able to come in and talk about what we've, we've got a great manager, fantastic background. Mm -hmm. How do we get that into a pipeline of deliverables? And, mm -hmm. and how do we look at um, what the digital hub is providing? Um, and it's a bit like the smart cities that, you know, when we go to our incubators or accelerators that are sitting within the digital hub, um, what's the problem we're trying to solve? and we'll be able to pinpoint that. Um, we already know, but we can pinpoint it much better and more effectively with infrastructure because we're coming from an engineering viewpoint. We can put that to an innovation team saying, here's our problem, can we solve this within Noosa? We know what's happening and we're all information sharing as local governments globally around waste. Um, so we know that there's a great pathway, but can we create a better one? Um, and that's how I'd see what some next steps are there, Councillor. Mm. Amelia and then Brooke. Um, my questions in relation to the three new roles to the structure, you mentioned um, in terms of the coordinator for the Office of Mayor, Councillors and Chief Executive Officer, that there may be some savings if we look at an internal secondment or outsource it. Mm. Can I request um, some pricing? So sure. uh, how big is the saving? And um, you know, I, I think we're entering a, a year where we've really got to be very careful with our spending and, um, you know, any saving is good mm -hmm. saving. Mm -hmm. So I would love to have that information before I made a decision and yeah. perhaps I'll defer the decision for the ordinary meeting. Can I, can I request that? Through, through the chair, absolutely, Councillor Fantastic. Lawrence. Yeah, um, and, and how I'd structure that for you would be is that... Um, if we had an internal secondment, the, yep. the saving would be a range on that seconded staff member. Okay. Um, and then if it was a, um, a contract cost, 
there's probably an on cost saving there. It wouldn't be, it was more the secondment that will give us more of a overall saving in the business. Um, but let us come back with that because I think it's important that we get that clarified for you, noting um, where we're coming into all the difficult budget. Um, Brian. Uh, yeah, it's just a flow on from the last conversation with yeah. Councillor Wigner. Uh, you, your last rec um, C was it in your recommendations about naming conventions. Mm. Is that where you're going to change the old fashioned word of waste to the new fashioned word of resource recovery? <laughs> <laughs> Through the chair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Look, we, we, we have discussed, we're actually waiting on the strategy for that, but uh, if we do have this resolution that gives us the ability to have resource recovery instead of waste. Uh, but um, that that would be the most extreme change. To be wasted, yeah. um, um, on the same on the, on the same uh, focus with regard to waste and infrastructure, there an element of climate change is the element of engineering that will go into climate change adaptation elements, and whether there's somebody an engineer out of infrastructure that sits within in the climate change um, um, area, is that something that's being looked at or considered? With regard to that, that, that ability to cross-pollinate between areas of council yeah. rather than within our silos. Councillor Drew, th this is what we're starting to see. We, we've got a great climate change team. Um, the engagement that I've had with them, they are highly motivated, they understand the issues and they really want to get in and make a difference. And uh, what we need to work our way through uh, is sometimes there's the adaptation and the mitigation factors around climate change that they can be at loggerheads a little bit. Well, also the implementation implementation and our um, our climate change team that they don't have that um, they just want to be able to get in and get the best solution um, and this is where they're sitting a bit above the business um, so we've got um, we've got Dean um, that's working through um, a, a range of processes within infrastructure um, the Kimpy Terrace foreshore area is a really good example around that and the design mm, that's been example, delivered. That's example of once we start to be able to get the um, environment and strategy team being agile and working within the business, um, that's the hope that um, we start to be able to see this take hold. And yes, while we have our traditional reporting lines, we have our structures, our hierarchy, we're government, we can't get away from that, so we can't go to Google. Um, but what we can do is start to be able to create some agile teams to deal with issues. and. This is one that we'll do, that. and waste will need to have a, a multi-department approach over time. Mm. Maria, um, resource recovery. Question: resource. Does organisational realignment create an aligned workplace culture, and is that the ultimate goal and measure of success? Through the chair, absolutely, Councillor Lawrenson. Um, you're looking at the metrics. So we will in March be undertaking our staff survey. Um, we've had a staff survey that was taken around about 14 months or so ago, maybe a little, little bit longer. Um, and yes, we want to be able to see um, some improvement in how our staff are coming to work, enjoying work, realigning, um, getting reporting lines that make sense. Uh, the amount of work that we've done to consult on this, um, the feedback, particularly from our manager cohort, is let's get it on and let's get it done. We really mm. want this, you know, I've, I've got a waste manager chomping at the bit mm. to sit with the engineers and get things moving. Mm. Um, we've got local laws and environmental health coming together a lot more strongly um, and they, I think, will absolutely flourish. Um, they will be more compliance focused, but I think that's where we need to be right now and they'll be around a group of people that can support them. Um, so there's those elements there. So yeah, the ultimate measure of success on this is having a workforce that's you know, not only delivering better services for the community, but it's going to be happy as a workforce and we see that turnover slow down. Um, but there, I'll, I'll just asterisk that where it's expensive to live in Noosa. Um, so mm -hmm. we're always, as a local government, with where we pay at different levels, it will be difficult over time for us and that, that's going to be a challenge that we'll have to deal with in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Karen uh, and then Jack. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, a comprehensive report. Thank you. Well done. In a relatively short amount of time, um, you've done a lot of work. Um, I can see that it's heading a lot towards a lot of strategy, better reporting lines, and heading upwards, um, which is good. And you've talked about um, people being pulled up above the business, not in it. Mm. Um, and considering we want to have a happy and engaged workforce, my question is, how are we ensuring that communication from a staff member 
when we're seeing a real high strategic level, what's their opportunity to still engage and find support through the new realignment? Um, you know, if a manager or an executive is like moving up above the business. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, through the chair, Councillor Finzel, the, the most important part for our council's communication is that um, we we lead from the front. So um, our values, um, I, I wanted our directors and managers to put those together because I want to see leaders that lead. Um, I want us to see our leadership team providing internal comms um, to the team. Mm -hmm. um, I have my CEO open door so that if somebody needs to be able to get in, um, I, I, I welcome that. Um, and our mechanisms for you know, having some strategic functions above the business, um, I'm wanting that team to be collaborative. And by nature of the, the members of that team or that department, um, they're collaborative people by nature because they're mm -hmm. already externally engaged with their community. Yeah. And so it's a very externally focused um, department. Um, so they'll be able to engage with strategy across the business. Um, but staff members being able to, you know, the line follows the line, mm -hmm. but where they need to reach out, they can. But really important that um, that we set, you know, not just the agenda from this council table, but mm -hmm. our exec table, our leadership table. Um, we now have uh, a different structure with how we deal with our leadership team meetings every month. We set the agenda for the month based on what council reports will be considered. Um, we know where we're going with our capital program, our marketing communications, where we're sitting with workplace health and safety, staff turnover. Uh, this is a high level of communication that we haven't had, um, mm -hmm. but we set the scene each month. What are the key messages? What do we want to achieve? And then we get in and we get it done. Um, yeah. And my expectation is, is that that just doesn't sit with directors and managers at the beginning of the month. Hopefully by the middle of the month, that's got through the whole business and everybody knows yeah. where we are. Mm. Fantastic. That's Joe. Thank you. Follow up on a question we asked earlier about permanency of staff. Is this the final piece of the puzzle that enables permanent positions for staff so that you've got the corporate, uh, the, the, the structure there to, to uh, assign those permanent positions? Mm. Do the Chair, Councillor Joe, look at it is, um, however, there, there are some requests that will come through as part of the budget process. Um, as an executive team, we want to very much scrutinise those. Um, I have a strong preference at the moment for having um, more blue collar boots on the ground mm -hmm. as opposed to more strategy staff. Mm -hmm. um, but we will go through as an exec team and we'll prosecute what's been put forward as budget bids. Um, but you know, we've done a great job with getting strategy together and people to be able to get to the next stage of strategy, um, we've got to get to the delivery. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really important element for me. Yeah. And just because you've written a strategy doesn't mean you get to write another one. Mm -hmm. Once you write your strategy, you need to be part of the team delivering the strategy. Yeah. Um, so that's where I want to be able to take us. But um, I, I really want to be able to look at how we can get some, um, yeah, literally more boots on the ground um, to be able to get out. Um, streets, parks, you know, storm water, um, the traditional local government delivery that we know that is day in, day out. How do we support um, the hinterland and the Pomona depot more? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and, and our team in the depot, they're working through that. Um, albeit it can be bumpy from time to time, they are trying to work through to how do we provide better services? Um, and between myself and Larry, we're working really hard um, to be able to take that team through that journey. Um, that's where we're at at the moment. So nearly the piece of the puzzle done, but um, there will be some requests in budget and we'll need to scrutinise that and, and talk about that as an exec before we get it to the council. Right. Yeah, um, I, we're councillor Lawrence and maybe we can move it to Pearl. I think it's appropriate to move the staff recommendation so we can talk about it here and leave Thursday night to just that one issue. Yeah. So I'll move the recommendation. Move councillor Stockwell. We have a second appointment. Second. Second. second at councillor Finzel. Yeah. Okay. I do so. Um, there's the old saying about form follows function, and I think when I look at what's been put before us, that it is a really logical grouping of functions, and therefore the form of council should logically follow it. Um, I see a number of benefits from the new department around compliance. Um, in the old days, we might have called that a one stop shop. But if you're doing a development or you're trying to get something started, that you, you know there's one group of people that will take you from beginning to end. So if, say if you want a development approval for a restaurant, you get your planning approval, you get your building approval for the fit out, and you get your environmental health. So if, if, if we can look at that as a customer service delivery portal to try and make 
that process as efficient and effective as possible, but also internally it's about also sharing experience and understanding of professionalism between groups at the moment which are divided. So when you're working in a compliance and approvals process, there's quite often a lot you can learn from others who have been doing it in different ways. So to me, that is a good step forward. And as mentioned, we've sort of been working on that basis with a locum uh, sitting uh, in the chair uh, for some, some months now. So to me, that's one important thing. I think the other one that's important is in the hierarchical structure on page 68 that the environment and strategy is up there. I actually prefer the, the little bit of a, a, a more less hierarchical version on the next page, which is yeah. the, the flower version. I reckon when we do that, the, the strategy and planning and environment department actually is the rosette around the mayor and councillors. I think it sits there and permeates out into all the other areas which are providing service delivery. They're about setting that and embedding both um, the downward approach that of the importance of some of those key policies within that area, but also filtering up the ideas and, and, and needs of the other into uh, the policy making environment. And I think that's, I suppose there's not one word that's not in there at the moment, it's policy. I see that area, you know, under the banner of strategy is also about setting that future policy and, and realising that the, the, the biggest challenges facing this council are yet to come. Mm -hmm. And so being prepared in that way, um, we will um, hopefully uh, be able to cement those challenges effectively and perhaps better than others. And I want to finish in the last point. It's really easy to read this report and say, okay, they've done a restructure and the only, only new staff are coming in at this level. Mm -hmm. I, I think what the CEO said just previously, I think this budget is where we have to start saying, how do we get more boots on the ground? <coughs> what have we outsourced and have continued problems with getting effective private delivery through consultants, through, through contractors, that really in this stage of the economic cycle we should be bringing back in and try and create more delivery workforce that we have ready access to. And I think that's the next step mm. after this one. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> I have a question for the CEO. Uh, <coughs> the um, the real organisational realignment is intended to reflect the new corporate plan. <coughs> Given that we're about to go out to <coughs> public consultation on the draft corporate plan, could you explain the reasons for the timing for uh, ratification of the realignment of the organisation ahead of ratification of the corporate plan? Yes. Okay. <coughs> then one's meant to reflect yeah. the strategies and actions of the other. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Thanks Councillor Wilkie. Um, really, it was it was just due to some timing issues that we've had overall. Um, our our plan was was to get all of these pieces of work to the council table um, for the end of the year. Uh, we've had some slippage around that, and given that was such a big year, I didn't want to be able to have the staff in a position where they were working day and night to get this done. Um, and, and it's that view of do you get these really big pieces of work done to say, oh great, we're going to start, um, you know, we've done this by the end of the year, the false deadline of Christmas, uh, or do we look at it um, in the new year and going, great, fresh start to the new year. We've, we've had a, about two, three weeks worth of slippage, and the view that I have around that is very much, um, I, was, I was not here with COVID, that was um, the biggest issues overall, um, but we've allowed some extra time to be able to get our structure right. We've needed extra time to go through the corporate plan. Um, this absolutely aligns to us for our corporate plan um, and we don't believe that we would see through the consultation process with the community any major changes um, because it is very much about functions. Um, so what we're wanting to be able to achieve and like our managers are asking us, so let's get on, let's get this realignment happening. We know it aligns to our corporate plan and what we want to be able to achieve. Yes, we have some community um, consultation around that, but we're really confident in the work that we've delivered. This reflects that corporate plan. Um, and if there is something that um, is misaligned, uh, we'll bring it back to council. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, I'll speak to it. Um, look, I do, uh, I do approve. I think there's some greater synergies in, in some of the alignments of uh, 
of the elements that you're producing or, or you're, you're proposing here with regard to how council runs in a more streamlined and more um, efficient fashion. Uh, my concern is, as always, silence and getting people outside of those those boxes and working in collaborative, you know, collaboratively within the organisation so they understand the functions and the elements of responsibility of other areas of council and how they align uh, and um, and influence the uh, the areas that they work in. Boots on the ground, great to hear you say that. That's been um, uh, a concern for a while with regard to um, outside contractors and the like, having the capacity when you need it and having the uh, um, uh, the internal functionality being able to deliver those uh, those those elements of council operations. Um, and an example of that is a patching crew. You know, well, you know we've, we've spoken about that. That was something that was removed as an efficiency measure some time ago in council. I didn't uh, didn't uh, agree with it at the time, and it's good to see us talking about bringing it back because um, you, know, you end up sweating assets in a completely different fashion, and you end up uh, costing yourself more in the long run. I mean, you know, there's there's economies of scale, and there's there's rhymes and reasons behind uh, um, some of the things you do. To having the capacity in council to be able to, to deliver those services means that you've got that uh, functionality there. Um, also, the opportunity for um, you know, giving staff more diverse roles and mm -hmm. I think more challenges within their, 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 their work environment. Um, uh, having those scope of, of operations means there are more, more areas to move within rather than saying, well, I'm only, I can only do this because there's only so many jobs within my my scope or within my realm, but if you uh, broaden those horizons, you may actually retain staff because they've got somewhere to go or, or a variety in their workplace and those sort of things. So uh, I uh, I'll wholeheartedly support this. Uh, I think it's uh, I think you've uh, you've done a great job of uh, having a look at the, the structure in the twelve months that you've been here or almost twelve months that you've been here, and I think this is a, a very logical and methodical conclusion that we've come to, to that, that you've reached uh, in the way that the, the um, factor the the needs and the uh, uh, and the wants of our community and our organisation going forward. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Stewart. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank the CEO um, and all the executive team because I know this has been a, a huge collaborative effort. And Scott, it was only it was less than twelve months ago. I think you took the chair mm -hmm. and. Um, remember the first report you came in, there were 64 recommendations in that very detailed report. Uh, and as you said, that was that was a very aggressive approach and this is a more moderate um, approach and one that probably um, we're ready for. Um, so I think that the realignment, um, I certainly agree with Councillor Lawrenston, you know, that we need to be very mindful of costs coming into the next budget or this budget. Um, so I look forward to receiving that information too because I think it's where we can minimise costs we need to. Yeah. Um, but this is a really streamlined approach, uh, this new realignment. It takes away pressure points from staff who have had so many direct reports uh, in the past. So it takes away, um, takes off some of the pressure that some of our staff have faced. Uh, it's a, I think it's, it's better focused on customer service, um, customer delivery. Um, as you said, talk about triaging events. We know we've had a number of concerns around events. I think this puts events in a really good spot will be able to triage and work with um, our event organisers in our community uh, in, in a more pro productive manner in this space. Um, it really focuses where talent, it's maximising talent in the organisation. We have so many talented people here. Yeah. It's really getting the most out of um, our staff members and letting them grow. And I believe many of them are very excited about this with the, with the new opportunities that it presents them uh, and where they can really um, you know, work to the best of their ability and capability. Um, it looks at waste, it, it, it wa wastes as, as Tom and Joel both said, it's a huge part of our organisation. We need to start looking at it as a commercial enterprise, as an opportunity. It's not just a cost and a, and a necessary, um, you know, general um, matter of council business. There's so many things we can do in this space and so many opportunities open to us. Um, having waste under infrastructure, I think that'll work really well because they do align um, leasing, we've got a lot of commercial, you know, again, um, our holiday parks, our commercial leasing, um, looking at how we can obtain the best return on investment for our community. Uh, that again is putting the right people in the right places and this does that. Um, it's less doubling of resources, as I said, it's more streamlined 
And I believe one of our directors, and I won't mention names, is when we said, are you looking forward to this? Their words were, bring it on. So I think that's, it shows that, that, that all of the executive team are very much behind this. Um, and I just want to take, um, say thank you again. And the takeaway for me is that this is a really fabulous thing for the organisation. Thank you, Scott, for your hard work. There's hundreds of hours involved in this. And to the team, it's real, as I said, it's, it's a joint collaborative approach and effort. And we really appreciate it. And we hope, our hope is that it makes your life easier. And, and no, no, that, that's the genuine hope, that it makes your life easier and that you know, our ratepayers, our community, our customers, um, it's better customer focus, better, better customer delivery. So it's better for our community and it's better for our organisation and our staff. So thank you. Tom. Can I speak for you? Um, I'm in ferocious agreement with the councillor Stockwell and the, and the rest of the councillors that have spoken. Um, I'd like to carry on the, the concept of form follows function to my favourite <laughs> philosopher, um, Horatio Greeno. And beauty is the promise of function. And so this is it's a beautiful piece of work that you've come up with because it has that promise of function. But many beautiful things, it's expensive. And, <laughs> and so... Women. I think Joe really said it perfectly when he said, you know, you don't sweat the assets, you know. And when um, Councillor uh, Stockwell says, boots on the ground, we're going to take these things internally that we keep spending money on, 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 on contractors for. Um, I think that our, what I've learned uh, about our uh, grants process is that we're proactive and we receive grant, grants and funding because we are proactive. We actually do the design of the project and then we wait for the grant to come and we're just bang on it, which mm. is where others you know, see the grants and then they apply for it. Mm. Well, we're, we're ahead of that and I think that this new structure absolutely fits that ethos of, of being forward thinking. And I, I, I really like, I think, I think it, it will de-silo. And I, when I think about our, the um, Waste Recovery Center and how I think things would have, may have been different had we had this structure from my time here, I think that we, we, things would have gone a different direction. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about this. So I'd really like to thank, thank you and um, all the directors and the team for putting this together because it just seems much more efficient and uh, right. yeah, much more re reflective of Newsom. Hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks everyone around the table. It's really positive. Thank you to the CEO and, and all the executive staff. Everyone's worked hard in, in a short amount of time to um, deliver this. Uh, what's exciting is that this is our first big step as councillors elect, um, and we're coming almost to another election <laughs> uh, where we can finally go. You know, we've made a, you know a collective decision um, around this. So I think that that is exciting. Um, Everything that's been said, you know, I reiterate, it's fantastic, the collaborative approach. And I mean, you know, if we can just reflect that through the whole of like this workplace, this organisation, out to community, and we've got everyone around these decision-making tables, I mean, that's just fantastic. You know, I've always said we've fundamentally changed since COVID, and I think leadership of the future is definitely collaborative. I think it's, you know, we've got to get every voice around the table and every voice matters. Um, so I think from, you know, our mums and dads out in community right through to, you know, our CEO, our executive team, staff, um, I think this is really exciting moving forward for all the reasons everyone's talked about today, you know, about the idea of being more efficient, better customer service back to our customers, uh, delivering. And what I love is the idea of our staff coming to work and being engaged in such a way that they can go home hopefully and feel my contribution is meaningful and that, that they can feel that they're... I don't know, their contribution through their employment value adds, not only to them personally, but they see that in their community. Um, and I think that's really exciting to get, you know, we've got really engaged community groups. They all come together. They've got great aspirations for their community. And I just see that everything can align through this. Um, like Councillor Tom said, you know, these things cost money. Money If you want quality and, you know, great aspirations and to live it, to deliver you know, wonderful things back to our community. It is a big investment, um, but I think we're well worth it. And I think for Noosa to go ahead with a sustainable and thriving future where community and everyone is engaged in a meaningful way to build the life that we envision, um, I think that's just really amazing to be mm. a part of that. 
and um, congratulations to all the councillors as well around the table um, that we've <laughs> navigated our way through this despite our like you know differences but I think that's great where we've been able to navigate our way through that with the corporate plan and the help of the staff through that process and CEO um, I think we're really looking forward to a good future thank you, yeah, thank you. Really? okay um, credit where credit's due thank you Scott um, it's great to have a new CEO with fresh eyes that's reviewing council's organisational structure and reporting relationships to see if all the staff and the departments are on the same page concerning the organisation's goal. Um, I love what's been proposed and what you've been working on tirelessly for the last 12 months. Um, it aligns with what I committed as a councillor when I came to council, that we have an obligation um, to continuous improvement. The mm -hmm. notion that it's not that we can do better, but we must do better. Um, I come from an employment law background. So to me, realignment is critical for all organisations. If we want to stay ahead, we must realign. Um, Strong organisational alignment commands buy-in buy and it creates positive workplace culture. Um, we talked about you know, engagement of uh, our, our employers. Um, I think this gives them the opportunity to be personally accountable um, and it gives them you know, the opportunity for everyone to commit to sharing the same goals. Um, and it also tells those who, who don't, um, it's, you know, you're, you're on the bus or you're off the bus. So bring it on. Um, thank you to the executive. I know you guys have partaken in this as well. Um, but, but thank you, Scott. This is future focused. Um, and it really prepares council for the challenges ahead. We're a growing organisation. You mm. mentioned today yeah. we've got 500 staff mm. plus, and there's la layers and layers of complexity mm. um, in that. Um, and we need to stay ahead and we need to stay focused um, and we need to continually do better. So thank you. <coughs> thank you. Um, just in order to move things ahead, I'll move the, the motion suggested earlier that we move this delay a decision till Thursday night. Amelia's moved it. Very ordinary meeting. Oh, I'm sorry? Amelia's moved it. Are we speaking of Brian's motion? Yeah, but I thought we were well, speaking of Brian's no, motion. No, no, Brian's no, motion. No, a proceed to motion can then yeah. Oh, up. Yeah. Okay. You, you want to second that? I'll second that, thank yeah. you. So I'll move it. Councillor Lawrence will second it, just to move things along. I'll wait till Thursday night to have my speech. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, I, I don't disagree with anything I've heard. That's right. <laughs> I had a really I'm strong looking at, close looking at too. This is mine. Oh, you can't want to breathe on that. I thought I'd do yeah, that. It's right. amazing. Yeah. 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 Just keep that. Yeah. Move, move <laughs> cancel. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Mr Chair, didn't we have... Didn't you move the motion? I did, but that's a procedural, so procedural motion. motion. Procedural motion. So it can come over the top. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, just for the reasons mentioned earlier, um, get further information on some of the costs. Yeah. Uh, we are all mindful of... Uh, budget issues going into this, uh, this, this coming budget and, uh, and uh, we'll be able to make, be better informed and make a decision Thursday night when we have those facts and figures. That's the reason for the motion. Anybody else wish to speak to it? No, I just haven't seen the original motion moved and seconded. Yeah, I have another one. That's, oh there it is, okay, sorry, that, the, the oh, fact that was not updating is throwing me, sorry. That's oh, why it's not updated. That's that's why it's Oh yeah, that's yeah. That's that's what sorry, yes, that's what I was seeing. That's why I was totally <laughs> bamboozled. Yeah. Oh, I thought, hang on, yeah, yeah, but yeah, they don't talk to each other. The yeah. two screens are separate. So sorry, right. sorry, that's why I was thrown by the what was in front yeah. of me. But what's the new realigned organisational structure? It'd be great to realign. It'd be great, great if the uh, two <laughs> all still been talking to each other. Yeah, oh, we still got one to go, haven't we? Right, okay. right. Look, if there's no more discussion, all in favour? That's carried unanimously. It'll come up to um, 
the next item, which was moved from the end of the from the start of the agenda. Signed, you should move to the meeting. Yeah, I move that the, the, the meeting be closed to the public pursuant to section. 254J3E of the Local Government Regulation 2012 for the purpose of discussing legal advice relating to an appeal in the Planning Environment Court um, with respect to item 7, MCU 19089.02 and Operational Works 19016002, Planning and Environment Court Appeal Number DB 928022. <laughs> Application for a minor change of, to develop approval for service station and shop and operational works signage at 54 Mary Street, New Southern. Maybe second. Maybe second. And Councillor Jurisdiction. I just Jurisdiction. want to clarify, you said item seven, it's written as item two. Did I say seven? You said seven. There are so many numbers. It's all right. Just clarifying that we are talking about item two. Mm -hmm. I know we just skip over them. Okay. For me, we're going to confidential section. I'm sorry, was that carried? Well, do we have to vote on it? We have, we have to, to vote, vote. 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 That's carried That's unanimously. Yeah. Just a moment. And, uh,
Not funny. <laughs> it is. Okay. All right. We have a motion before us. I'll move the staff recommendation. Uh, Councillor Stewart's moving the staff recommendation. Seconded, Councillor Lawrenson. Any discussion? No. I'll put it to the vote. All in favour? That's Councillor Finzel, Councillor Jurisovic, Councillor Lawrenson, Councillor Stewart, Councillor Wigner, Councillor Wilkie. Against, Councillor Stockwell. Motion's carried. That is the end of today's general committee meeting. Declare the meeting closed. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. 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 Thank